call the board of uh, meeting of the Board of Regents of Delmar College to order at 9 a.m. It's Friday, uh, April 12th. I almost said October. Friday, <laughs> April 12th. <laughs> uh, we do have a quorum and can conduct business. Uh, if we could please begin with a moment of silence. Thank you. Uh, Ms. Averett, as uh, the, the newbie on the block, would you lead us in the Pledge of Allegiance, please? <laughs> I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you very much. And as is our custom, could we repeat, uh, join together in reading the Delmar College mission statement. Delmar College provides access to quality education, workforce preparation, and lifelong learning for student and community success. Delmar College is streaming live audio and video from the official Board of Regents meeting on the college's website in real time, with the exception of portions of the meeting considered to be closed session by statute. We have one item uh, on the agenda today, and that is our discussion related to our strategic planning uh, for 2019 through 2024. This is the third retreat uh, that the board has had in strategic planning, uh, and so we're going to do a little bit of um, history uh, today so that the newer regents can, can kind of bring, be up to speed. Uh, Dr. Escamilla is obviously meeting with, with uh, regents separately to, to help in their orientation and onboarding, and that's one of the topics that he is covering with them. So if there's a little bit of repetition for the rest of us, it probably can't hurt because I've slept since then. <laughs> it's always good for me to have a reminder, let me put it that way. So I'm going to turn everything over to Dr. Escamilla and his team, uh, and then we he'll, they'll have us with formal, uh, formal opportunities to uh, interject our opinions, but at, at the same time, if there's a question, if there's something as we go along, please feel free to uh, stop the, the proceedings and let's, let's answer any questions you have. Dr. Escamilla. Good morning, everyone. Is that, is that not work? Is that working a little bit? Working? There it is. All right, well, good morning, everyone. Uh, regents, um, faculty, staff members, guests from the community, thank you all for being here this morning with us. Uh, today's a, a, a great milestone in our planning efforts here at the college with our, as we develop our next uh, strategic plan that'll take us into the next five years beginning this coming fall. We're in the last year of our existing plan and so we're wrapping things up as we prepare to uh, put together our uh, tenure affirmation, reaffirmation for accreditation, Right here, sir. And uh, I just wanted to share a few thoughts about how we're going to move ahead. One thing is we do have a 12:30 uh, timeline for today. We're going to be as prompt as we possibly can because I think there, there are many other uh, um, um, obligations this afternoon, and we're going to be very uh, watchful of your time. So I'm going to be very brief. Again, as uh, Regent Scott said, this is the next step. This is the third meeting the regents have held. We are going to be looking for uh, our next opportunity, probably uh, in in June. Okay, do we have do we have that date set? June eleventh. Okay, I was going to say the seventh. Okay, glad I didn't. Um, so, but I did. So June eleventh will be our next opportunity to come together, and then we'll be able to do final final touches on this plan um, as we conclude um, with the budget, prepare for the new academic year sometime in August. Uh, should, that, should that be necessary, that opportunity is available. Um, just as an FYI, um, I, wanted, I wanted everyone to know that I will be having a college-wide meeting uh, in a couple of weeks. I think it's the 26th of this month. It's a, it's a staff meeting. It's not a convocation or anything like that. But I just, I'm, I'm sharing this with you all to let you all know that I'll be talking to the college. And this will be one of the items that I'll be carrying to a college-wide um, college-wide meeting. I prefer college-wide meetings in the spring as opposed to convocation because lots of things bake more fully, if you will, and I um, am able to present better information that is more relevant as many of them, especially the faculty, prepare to leave uh, for the summer. And uh, they take with them the freshest uh, data and information in any way. Uh, so, let's see. 
And that's really it. Um, other than that, uh, it'll, again, we have a robust discussion and opportunity with our presentation this morning. Dr. Christina Wilson will be facilitating uh, today's uh, meeting as she did last time and as she will into the future as we uh, solidify this plan. Again, what I've said, uh, and I'll conclude with this, um, what I've said about uh, strategic planning at the college is this is our third time. This is our third time as a, as a college to go through uh, this sort of planning um, uh, process, okay? And that speaks volumes to the college's collective effort to come together and, and put together a, a framework, a basic framework that guides us into the future. You all, as regents, as you will hear a little bit later, as a, as, a, as a publicly elected board, set the vision, and it's up to your uh, college to come together and formulate um, strategies and action plans to execute uh, that vision. This will be the last thing I say. There will be data. We use data as a tool. There will be lots of data discussed today. We use data as a tool. It is not a weapon. It is, used to, it is meant to be used to improve upon. Uh, there will be some frank conversations today. We must have those bold conversations today in order to improve. And there are some things that we are, uh, there's, there are some things that we just absolutely are going to brag about, and there's going to be some other things that we're going to sit here and say, those are our opportunities. And so we, we say that with a, with a full heart and a full head of steam as we uh, prepare for today's conversation. So without further ado, we've got Dr. Christina Wilson. Uh, Dr. Christina, the stage is yours. Thank you all. Good morning, everyone. So good to see you here at our third uh, strategic planning well, retreat. Well, the amount of information they know. Um, but just, uh, uh, just a quick recap. I mean, we... Okay, I can use a handheld if that's... Um, so that we can talk about the issues, um, and more specifically, talk about how teens are in Hello. Is it just me here? Is it just me? Okay, perfect. <laughs> Let me cue up that PowerPoint real quick. Which PowerPoint was it that you were needing? It is that one. Mm -hmm. There you go. Okay, excellent. Good morning again. It's just me here, no additional voices. Um, as we've stated already, this is our third strategic planning retreat. So I'm really pleased to be able to show you the progress that we've made so far and to get your feedback on our vision, our mission, and our core values. And I'm really pleased to share with you what our students are telling us as well as our faculty and staff. To start with, let's discuss big picture overview. Del Mar College operates on a five-year planning cycle our current strategic plan ends this August. That's where our timeline is headed. We want to approve the new strategic plan by August. We want our plan not, uh, we want it to develop a plan that doesn't just document what we do, but we want it to document where we're going. We want to focus on continuous improvement. And as we've heard quite a bit from our regents, we want to make sure that we have strong key performance indicators so we know that we're making progress and so we'll know when we meet our targets. And of course, our strategic planning cycle is also tied to the budgeting process. All right, as Regent Scott mentioned, we've slept since the last meeting. Let me give you a, a recap of, of all of the activities that we've participated in. Our first ret retreat was in September. This was discussing the process in general, what was gonna happen over this next year, laying out our goals. In November, we met again, and we looked very deeply at our internal student data and also on our regional um, external data. Today, as Dr. Escamilla mentioned, we're going to be sharing the progress that we've made and also spending time developing our mission. What do we want the college to look like in five years? 
And then finally, we do have another meeting planned in June where we'll give you a draft of the strategic plan so you can tell us, is this, does this fit with what we've told you so far? Does this capture where we want to go in the next five years? All right, again, so today we're going to talk about our strategic issues. We've been having focus groups. Um, first, we had in November, we had a SWOT analysis here with the board, but we've also been having focus groups with faculty and staff and students to figure out what are those issues and opportunities that we can ignore in the next five years? What are those things that we must address? So we're going to share some of those, those main themes with you. We're going to work on defining our vision and then confirm our, our mission and our core values. All right. Again, a little bit of the same. Um, we're going to have a break worked in after the first agenda item, give you a time to stretch your legs. We'll have lunch a little bit later on. And as Dr. Escamilla said, we'll be done before 1230. So at this point in time, I'm going to hand it over to Dr. Beth Lewis, who's going to be sharing with us some key takeaways from that first retreat. Thank you. Thanks, Christina. It seems like it's been a long time since September, right? So let me remind you a little bit about some of the things that we were talking about then. If you'll remember um, that day, the skies opened up and we just about got washed away, right? And remember that happened at the second retreat too. So when I woke up this morning and I thought, no rain, no floods. I don't know if that's good or bad, but here we are. So remember in the first retreat, one of the things that we wanted to make sure was the concept of strategic planning, because it's one of those ideas that everybody thinks, oh, I know what a strategic plan is. I do that all the time. We always look at that. But we talked about some very specific ideas in strategic planning. We've also talked about the SCUP model, the Society of College and University Planner model. Um, and what we want to do most always is answer the question, what do effective, actionable, actionable strategic plans and community colleges look like? We talked about that some strategic plans are what we call shelf documents, right? They, they're gorgeous. They're absolutely beautiful. And everybody goes, great, we have a strategic plan. Boom, <laughs> bookshelf, never look at it again. Okay, because it's got everything in it. It becomes this huge document that just lists everything and everybody, but it's not really actionable. Remember, we want to make sure that whatever we do in the strategic planning process motivates the planning process. Remember this slide? Remember all of the things that we're trying to balance at once, right? I don't know, does anybody in here juggle? You can juggle? Okay, gosh, I wish we had known that because we would have put you on the spot. Ms. Averett, can you talk a little bit? Just like, no, I mean like 15 seconds. How did you learn to juggle? I read a book called Juggling for Dummies. Okay. <laughs> okay. This will be part two, strategic planning for dummies, right? We'll just bring it all, all together here. But look at all of the things that we are trying to keep in the air at the same time. And that is the point when you're juggling. You can't drop anything. Everything has equal importance. One ball is not more important than the other one. Everything has to keep going. State and federal mandates, local workforce demands, facilities, equipment, and technology, evolving student needs. We could do a whole strategic planning just on that topic. <laughs> Oh, excuse me. <clears throat> Our student success rates, we'll talk more about that in a second. Faculty engagement, new learning modalities, high touch, high tech, and of course, our always favorite accreditation requirements. Planning today is very much on the forefront of our accountability and of our accrediting body. Southern Association of Colleges and Schools Commission on Colleges, or what we call SAC COC. They demand now in several sections, they demand coordination between the administrative and the academic. Before, I think you could get by with having a strategic plan that had those as almost separate houses with a bridge in between the two, but not, you know, it didn't have to really be connected. Now it has to be completely intermeshed. I talked about the SCUP planning model a little bit earlier. 
the Society of College and University Planning. Um, I love that we've highlighted here sustainable approach because I don't ever want us to spend all this time and energy on a strategic plan for something that we can just check the box and go, yep, we've got a strategic plan, here it is. It needs to be sustainable, it needs to be living, and it needs to be um, agile. It needs to be something that if we are given an amazing opportunity or awful, if we have some sort of, of tragedy we have to respond to, that we have the ability to make that happen. So integrated planning, according to SCUP, it builds relationships, it aligns the organization, and it emphasizes the preparedness for change. Change is so hard for all of us, right? If, if you've ever tried to have a lifestyle change of your own, you've tried to lose weight, you've tried to work out every day, you've tried to stop swearing, not that I would know anything about that. Um, you know how difficult that is because it's so easy to get back in those same ruts. It's just, it's what you know, it's comfortable. And so change is hard and we always fall back on what's easy. If you'll remember, we talked about this model as showing us where we are in the process. So first, assessing the landscape, second, planning roadmap, third, creating the plan, fourth, implementing the plan, and five, evaluating the outcomes. Where are we right now? Yep, between two and three. Okay, I know you all got that right. When does this happen? Here we go. So this gives you an idea of where we are and how all of this comes together. And by August of this year, we're going to have a brand new five-year strategic plan, which is so exciting because there's so many things happening at the same time. We're going through reaccreditation. We're going through uh, huge, huge structural changes. Um, we're going through some personnel changes. We've got lots of things happening. We'll talk more about pathways and, and the kinds of things we're doing with that in just a second. So who's on the strategic planning committee? You'll remember we talked in September that we have a big involvement from a lot of key stakeholders. We have representatives from the faculty council, the chair's council, dean's council, all of the staff councils, student government, um, and she's been amazing. Our representative from student government shows up to every meeting and she doesn't sit quietly. She says, hey, hang on, what about this? We love it, she is tremendous. Um, our executive team members are on it, so we want to make sure that every corner is represented here. Okay, so this is a bit of a reminder on that pyramid, and we've talked about this before, the components of the strategic plan. It's not by accident, and it is not unusual that your mission statement is at the bottom. It is the, it is the basis of the pyramid. It is the most important thing you have to figure out because everything else builds on top of it. And if you don't have a solid mission statement, you don't know why you exist, right? That's a problem because everything you build on top of that is building on sand and it will not last and it will not be successful. One of my very favorite expressions is if you don't know where you're going, any road will get you there. If you don't know why you exist, whatever you do after that is folly, okay? On top of that, you've got your values. How do your values get expressed through your mission statement? Your vision, where do you want to go with your values and your mission statement? Your goals and objectives, how you get there and implement, which everyone always wants to start with. Let's write a strategic plan. Here's what you need to do. You need to do this, you need to do this, you need to do this. That's the last piece and you can see it's kind of the smallest triangle. It's almost the, the least important in that you've got to do all the hard work before that. Okay, so just kind of remember that visual there that everything has to look like that. When I was reviewing these slides, I was thinking, that looks exactly like what? What does that look like to you? Your windshield, yeah. It looks like a windshield, right? Why is your windshield so big and your rear view mirror is so small? because where you're going is usually more important than where you've been, okay? And so when you think about your windshield being the vision, uh, the vision, the values, and the mission statement, that's where we're going. That's what's ahead of us. Okay, and Dr. James is going to remind you of this exercise. I, you had so much fun with it the last time, and those of you who hadn't had a chance to do it, 
get a chance to do it now. So Dr. James, I'll let you take over here. So you have in your folder um, a paper that has the pyramid at the top, I believe, and then this piece at the bottom. But what I'm going to ask you to do is be a little interactive. I have the pieces of the pyramid here, and I'm going to ask our regents to each, whoever, there's only five, so only five of you get to participate, sorry. To over here, I'll move the, we also have um, printed up, we have a place for you to tape the pieces of the um, the pyramid onto the definitions. So you have the, the paper there to kind of help you figure out, but I'm going to ask you to tape these onto this board. So I'm going to hand these out and then move the board and ask you to help us put this together as to the definitions of the different pieces of that planning pyramid. There we go. So look at what you did and what they did. Do you think your your colleagues got that right? Do you agree with the definitions? <laughs> oh, good. Whew. All right, I'll turn this back. <laughs> I'll turn this back over to Dr. Lewis now. A little nervous. A little pop quiz, right? Let's see how you did. Are we good? <laughs> no. <laughs> we never like class early, Miss Estra. Okay, so remember that when we're looking at these things, and it's so easy to get them confused, when you start talking about your vision and your mission, and it all becomes sort of word soup at some point, where everything is floating around and you're trying to figure out what exactly are we talking about and how does that differ? Remember, these are pretty key definitions and I think they're pretty clear for us. Okay, this is probably one of my favorite um, descriptions because it is fairly simple. So mission and vision represent the current and envisioned state of the institution. The strategic plan is used to bridge the gap between the two. So all you have to remember is your mission statement is who we currently are your vision statement is who we want to be, right? Mission is current, vision is what we want to be. Okay, now you knew it wouldn't be something that I would talk about if there's not a picture of a dog, right? So we've got to have a dog. Um, why is this here? How deep is the mud? Depends on how, who you ask. Every school, every community college, every university, every system has its own challenges and we all go through the same stuff but we go through it differently, right? So different colleges, different plans, everything is dependent on what they're trying to do. Their local needs, their size, their history, their culture. Culture eats strategy for breakfast every day. And if you don't know what your culture is and you start trying to implement something that is against that culture, 
you're going to have a lot of problems. People are going to resist, and it's probably not going to be successful. What's your funding structure? Are you a private university that gets lots of donations from people and you don't really have to worry about money? Or are you a community college where um, with one act of the legislature things can change dramatically? <coughs> Pardon me. Identifying those strategic issues. When Christina and I were talking about this, we went kind of round and round about, do we want to use the word problem? Pressing problems, significant opportunities must be addressed. Pressing problems, problem sounds kind of negative. Do we want to say that? Do we want to bring that up? Yes, because how do you change what you don't acknowledge? We're going to be looking at some data in a little bit that is problematic. There's no two ways about it. It's problematic. But we're going to talk about why is that then an opportunity to make some changes? Okay. So identifying the strategic issues. Now, remember the slide that I showed you with the juggling and all of those issues around there, right? Every one of them is equally as important as the other. And you can't say, oh, well, our student needs are more important than our state funding. But that's more important than our community involvement and our community support. But that's more important than everything has equal, <coughs> excuse me, equal importance. So when we start talking in a few minutes about strategic issues and goals and objectives, again, it can be a little bit of word soup here. But remember that our goal is simply how are we going to implement that vision? Get us to where we want to go. That's what our goals do. Pardon me, I've been struggling with my allergies for about three weeks now. Um, so the strategic issues, when we have those identified, are going to pull those goals, and our objectives are going to be how we get there. <coughs> we are, as you know, working toward that new plan. Key things here, developed by the stakeholders. I talked a little bit before about who those people are, our strategic issues. Tied to those key performance indicators, or KPIs, Christina's going to talk more about that in just a second, and implemented intentionally by all programs and units of the college so that everybody knows what road we're on and where the road is going, and most importantly, we, why we want to get there. And it's not Christina, it is Miss Keys. Oh, water hello. Water. Oh, she, oh, the water delivery fairy. <laughs> Thank you so much. Now, I was thinking, no, we rehearsed this, it's Christina. Thank you, Lenora. <laughs> okay, thanks. All right, that was retreat one. That's what we did in September. Now let's talk about November. That was our full day retreat. So again, the goal of this retreat was to look at our internal and external environments. So we talked a lot about our student data. Who are they? How are they doing? Where are those areas that we want to focus? And then VP Keys also talked quite extensively about some of the local changes, some of the um, economic development um, investments that are happening in our region. So we got, we received a lot of information about what to expect in the next five years. And we really focused on trying to identify those strategic issues. What are those factors we need to focus on for the future? We did that in November, and let's, let's talk about um, what we discovered. All right, so let's start at the beginning. Who are our students? How many do we enroll? This last year, we had a headcount of just over uh, 24,000, just under 24,500 students total. Of the student body, 63% are our credit um, students. So overall, that number includes our credit and non-credit. And who are they? What does the composition look like? They are primarily female, primarily Hispanic. Most of our students are enrolled part-time, 77%, and the average age of our student is 23. 70% of our students are classified as freshmen. What does that mean in a community college? What that means is that they they have earned less than 30 credit hours. So the majority of our students are just beginning their college journeys. 
62% receive financial aid that includes um, grant or loan, so that's a large population there. 19% of our student body are enrolled in high school at the same time, 19%. That's a big population. And finally, 34% of our students this last year were enrolled in one or more online courses. So you can see where we're going. Lots of online courses, more and more dual enrollment students. Again, as I mentioned, VP Keys talked a lot about our external environment. 50 plus billion dollars of investments. Um, our port, um, fifth largest in oil exports. So there's a lot of a lot of change and a lot of growth to anticipate. We can um, most definitely anticipate the need for an educated workforce based on these changes. All right. We spent a lot of time in November on our SWOT analysis. This is where, as a board, you brainstormed and identified those internal strengths and weaknesses, and also those external opportunities and threats that you believed are the things that are most important to us here at Del Mar. So first, you brainstormed, and then you prioritized. So here's some proof, y'all. You were there. <laughs> I'm not making this up, you are there. So what you see, you have the O and the T, the opportunities and the threats. That was after you brainstormed, after we prioritized. There's just a few, a few of the things that, that rose to the top of that process. So afterwards, taking those notes, taking those priorities, what we did in the committee is we took those priorities and we started to put a structure around them. We've been talking already about strategic issues here this morning. Those opportunities, or you can call them problems, issues that we want to make sure we focus on. KPIs, how are we going to measure our progress? And then finally, strategies. As Beth mentioned, it's so easy sometimes to say, okay, quick, we're just going to act. Um, but but we, don't want, we don't want to just act. We want to make sure we have a full understanding of our whole environment, make sure that our issues are aligned with our KPIs and our strategies. So I'm showing you this structure because this is how we took your feedback and how we structured it. So let me give you an example. So opportunities, for instance, these are all... Um, these are all of the priority opportunities you identified. Well, some of them could be KPIs. Retention came up quite a bit. Um, are our students staying with us after they enroll? What about affordability? That's something that we can measure ourselves against other community colleges. That may also be a strategy, staying affordable. So we went through and we, we created that structure. So eight week terms, addressing part-time students, making more sophomores. So we, we took some, some liberties and we put it into a structure, which you'll see in just a minute. All right, so based on their, those priorities, we organize them into four key areas. Student completion, student retention, college readiness, and financial effectiveness. So let's dig into each of those. Completion. We talked about that a lot on Friday. On Friday. <laughs> Today is Friday. Uh, in November, that Friday in November. Um, we talked a lot about whether our students are meeting their goals. Are they earning the credentials that they come here seeking before they leave us? So there's quite a few ways that we can measure that. These are just a few of the ways that we can do that. Part of what we want to do in our strategic plan is to solidify those indicators that are important to us. So we're going to take a few minutes and look at where we are currently with these KPIs so you can get a sense for um, how our completion numbers are looking. So again, various ways you can look at it. You can look at the number of graduates each year. You can look at our rates, which follows particular cohorts when they start with us and what happens to them over time. We can measure how long it takes students to graduate and also how many credits they earn in the pursuit of graduating. And percent of students enrolled part-time. I know that was something that was very concerning um, to our regents because when you're part-time, it takes longer, of course, to graduate. Okay, so first, number of degrees and certificates awarded. 
As you can see, for the last few years, that number has increased steadily. And at this point, we are actually at an all-time high. This is something to be very, very proud of. The number of degrees and certificates we are awarding every year is increasing. And this is something that our state is looking at as well. The 60 by 30 plan has charged us with creating more graduates, and we are well in line with meeting those targets based on these numbers here. They look excellent. Before we move on, though, I think it's important to talk about how we have gotten to that point in these last couple of years. And so the, the nudge campaign is a big part of that because mm -hmm. Dr. Silva in, in identifying folks who were close to graduation within a few credit hours and you were helping them wrap that up. So I, I don't want folks to leave thinking that just happened happenstance or all of a sudden our students were more motivated in 2017 and 2018 than they were in 2015 and 2016. Mm -hmm. But can, are there a couple of other things that we might want to identify that were, we think were causal in, in that scenario? So there's a uh, couple of thoughts that come to mind because um, I have thought about that, especially when, as we put this presentation together. Um, we know that there's been a more uh, intensive effort um, in our advising, um, we know our embedded advisors do things that are very different than our centralized advisors. Um, and I think that's an initiative, I, no, I know that's an initiative that uh, Dr. Halcom helped us with years ago through some grants efforts and that continues to make a uh, profound experience. Now we're combining those two, <laughs> those two, those two uh, enterprises, if you will, our, our counseling system um, and our Civitas system. And we're going to talk a little bit more about that next at next board meeting. But for today, um, Leticia Wilson, um, who is one of our chief, or one of our just dynamite, they're all dynamite, but, but she is our um, embedded advisor who will become our kind of our advising czar. And um, that's not the title. Okay, I'm just using that for, <laughs> that's, that, that is not the title. But um, who will be our, our um, advisor, uh, over those two enterprises and helping us to also enter um, our, Q, our new quality enhancement plan as a part of our, our accreditation, which will most likely be uh, around advising. So we have a full advising revamp. Okay, answer the question. Long story short, there's, there's several things. There's, there's more uh, intensive um, um, review of the data. There's more um, communication with our faculty and staff uh, around these kinds of things. And, um, you know, when you facilitate all these things with good technology, good things happen. Okay, I'll get you a more scientific answer as we start uh, delving through the data, but we do know that those uh, two phenomena are the, uh, those two enterprises are the ones that have come to the forefront and helped with um, these types of numbers. What impact did reverse transfer have on these? <laughs> So I, I don't have the, the data on the number of reverse transfers. I know there was an initiative, uh, Dr. Silva. Yeah, especially. Did you get a microphone? Can we get a microphone? I know we had, we had, we were making some efforts and I think there are some opportunities still. There you go, there you go. Yes, sir. And, uh, on, uh, okay, there you go. Uh, I don't have all the, the data. There's been some impact. I, I really think reverse transfer is more of an opportunity for the future. We have great relationship with AM Corpus, obviously, and AM Kingsville. Uh, and so we'll be working on that. Uh, much of the impact has been, like Regent Scott and Dr. Scamilla alluded to, our efforts in the last years to target students who are 75% complete in the program and make a conscious decision between faculty, uh, uh, graduation coaches, and advisors to get them to apply for graduation and get them on, online on a degree plan. I believe there's some legislation also, Mr. Bennett. Um, it comes up every session. I, I don't know how, how this one will rise to the top, but there's always legislation out there. Someone with the idea that um, legislating um, the opportunities and, uh, for, for higher education institutions to uh, make it automatic, um, to make things more automatic. A lot of things have to be done through uh, checks and balances through the law. And if they, uh, so what I understand is that there's legislation that are uh, smoothing out those roadblocks, if you will, to make that overall process throughout the state um, more automatic and certainly easier. My point in bringing it up was a compliment to you all 
that you are can, you're, you're making some significant improvements even while we're in, undergoing the strategic plan review and, and update for for the coming five years. So I did, but I also wanted to point out for folks who may, may look at that and go, wow, that's a great trend, uh, but there, there were some specific reasons behind it. Yeah. Ms. Carroll, I'd like to add also that to what you said that I feel like we've created a culture of caring. I think there's a lot more advising going on. I think Dr. Silva has done a great job with, with his staff mm -hmm. in advising our students, and I think that has led to more certificates and, and uh, associates degrees being awarded. Good point. Okay, sorry, sorry for the interlude, but can, thought it can was I ask important. Request, do we have any sense of where we'll, we'll be in 2019? I know we don't have numbers, but is is uh, we expecting can, this? To we can trend it up, uh, but it'll, it'll all be based off of uh, data that we um, derive off our fall enrollments coming up. So, and uh, yeah, it, this is a. Uh, we, we we still need some preliminary data to to build that up, I and mean, we we can trend that up just statistically, um, percentage wise. Um, but that does us some pretty powerful numbers, nevertheless. And um, I don't, I, we, we haven't changed anything in those regards. So. Yes, very, very good point. This does, doesn't just happen on its own. Lots of work has been done to, to increase those numbers. So this isn't the only way to look at completion. We do want to compare ourselves to ourselves over time, look at trends, but we also want to know how we're doing in regards to our peers. The state of Texas classifies community colleges based on their size, and Del Mar College is considered a large college. We are in the large college cohort. So we're going to take a look at some additional completion data, and we're also going to compare ourselves to our cohort. If you're curious about who else is a large college, let's take a look. We have our friends from all around the state. So we're not um, small, we're not very large, we are, we are large and we are in good company. All right, so we looked at the number of certificates and degrees awarded, but now let's look at cohorts. Um, I'm not sure what this is. I'm gonna decline it. All right, <laughs> I'm just gonna say no. Mm. All right. All right. Yes. Okay. Okay. Got it. Got it. Okay. Let's look at cohorts. When students start with us for the first time, what happens to them over time? How many of them meet their goals of earning their credential? So let's look at a few different cohorts. What we're looking at are cohorts that enrolled three years ago, four years ago, and six years ago, and how many of them graduated. So here are our numbers. Part of what's challenging about tracking cohorts is that first time in college student cohorts are actually quite small at community colleges. Um, we have students that enroll with us and stay with us for quite a while. As you saw, 77% of our students are part-time. So when you're looking at cohorts, um, this is actually a small piece of our population. Despite that, this does have value because it shows us um, how we're impacting this particular group and also how we compare to our, to, our, um, to our peers. We'll look at that in just a second. Did you have a comment on that, Regent Scott? Yeah, and I appreciate your, um, your characterization that this statistic has value because I don't believe that it does. <laughs> because it is such a small cohort, because mm -hmm. it's first time in college student, and so no dual credit students count. Uh, students who enroll for less than 12 semester credit hours their first semester in college don't count. So I, while I appreciate that this is how we're compared and this is what the state does from a comparison standpoint, um, and we will always answer this question as the state requires us to do, mm -hmm. but I don't particularly believe that first time in college uh, completion rates have a lot of value for us because they don't count some of our, some of our real successes. So, mm -hmm. sorry. I and that always have to throw that in there because I, I really I that's a, very very valid. And if we we took a look at the list of KPIs we're looking at, I love data. I love it. It gives you information. I always I always think we should look at multiple measures, and this is just a piece of it that tells our story. Regent Rivas, did you have a comment? Yeah, what, what, uh, what's the, the need for developmental education taken to this into this 
into these numbers? We are going to talk specifically about those, about students who are underprepared when they come to us, mm -hmm. but um, specifically as they impact these numbers, um, students in our first time in college cohort, um, those do include students who are unprepared. And as you'll see a few slides down, the majority of our FTIC students do come to us unprepared in one or more subject areas. Mm -hmm. So I, I love data, I love it, but does one indicator tell the whole picture? It really doesn't, but that's why we have multiple, that's why we look at it, and as Dr. Escamilla started the day with, it's a tool. Yes, well, mm -hmm. one other thing just really quickly, and the disadvantage for all of this are yeah, the disadvantage is, you know, our 60 by 30 is not built with complete measures. Our state's blueprint is not built with complete measures for community colleges by, mm -hmm. by a long shot. And I will add that just as soon as this, this, this past week, uh, we were, Delmar College uh, was testifying on changing that, albeit to a slider, to a slight, with a very specific piece around truck driving certificates. Um, you know, um, I just want to say that we had an opportunity to, to testify at the legislature, uh, working with our own representative, J.M. Lozano, um, because he believes in changing that blueprint and, uh, and amending that blueprint so that we can tell the full story, as Regent Scott was describing. Uh, so many data are left out, so many pieces. But that's the, good, that's the good thing about our plan being our plan for our future. Uh, but I just wanted to add that. All right, so this is our data with our cohorts. One other question sure sorry about that I want I would like to clarify for um, future maybe we don't have to do it today but I think dual credit students are included in first time full time in college they are included after they graduate from high school right. if yes after they've graduated from high school but if they're they, if they are dual still in high school no, they're not included, not included. Right. yes ma'am Yes. Mm -hmm. All right, so we took a look at our numbers. Let's take a look at our peers. So we have an opportunity here. Our peers are under the same restraints. They serve similar populations, so it helps us to, to measure ourselves. Um, how are we doing? So this is, this is one of those particular indicators that concerns us. And we'll talk in a little bit, in a little while, about some of the, some of the things we're doing even ahead of the strategic plan to address, to address these numbers. But this is one concern. We do know that this particular cohort gives us only limited data, but we, we want to learn from our peers as well. We want to, we want to not be behind. Okay. Any I, questions about that? I have a that? question on the six-year one. Sure. <clears throat> the other large colleges progress from 18 to 38 percent. We go down on the six year. We do. Why is that? Well, this number was recently updated. Our last cohorts, we did have that increasing trend. But as you'll see, we're actually following different cohorts here. So for some reason, the group that enrolled six years ago in 2012, their rates happen to be lower than the group that enrolled in 2014. It's just the particular group of students. Mr. Bennett, I think I, I can take a stab at that. Um, I think you and I have chatted about this before also. Um, you have to look at the types of services offered at those institutions, um, not in the way of instruction or support services necessarily. But you've got to look at the different nature of those institutions, and the majority of those up there um, are residential institutions. And we will show that this, this, it shows, our, our statewide data shows that those residential institutions has, have shorter time to completion. Why? The students are putting their heads down at, the, at just almost yards or even feet away from the building that they're studying and, and eating in and living in. So there's, I believe, and through my experience and through the, the data will show, the trend um, of shorter time to completion for residential instit institutions. We are a commuter college. So let's look at another very valuable indicator of completion. Let's look at those students who successfully earned their associate degree. 
So this isn't a cohort. This isn't um, dual credit or not dual credit. These are students who graduated in 2018. Um, actually, no, it doesn't include dual credits, but if they came to us, they would have been, if they came to us after high school, they wouldn't be, be they would be included. So let's look at those successful students and how long it took them to graduate and the number of credits that they earned toward an associate degree. So let me, let me ask pop quiz. How many hours are in an associate degree? How many, how long, how many hours are required in an associate degree? 60, perfect. You've been paying attention, perfect. 60 hours. So that those associate degree um, graduates should have earned 60 hours, give or take a couple. So let's take a look at those students. On average, the students that graduated in 2018 with their associate degree, it took them 5.1 years, which isn't necessarily surprising considering that the majority of our students are part-time students. You also need to couple that with the hours that they took. So 93 hours. When we talk about opportunities, that is one for us. And that those particular hours do not include any dual credit that they took or developmental coursework. So what we're finding from students when we talk to them, when we talk to our graduates is our students change majors. Our students are unsure of what they want. Um, and they stay with us for maybe longer than, than they need to before they transfer. So of course we want them to graduate earlier. Some of that we can't control if they're part-time students, but it's at 93 number. That's the one that really gets us. The other thing that concerns us is our, is our peer group. So we started these numbers looking at the number of graduates. Our numbers are increasing. We're getting more students to graduate, but we're realizing that we need to focus on how long they're taking to get there. What are the courses that they're taking? And Dr. Escamilla and Dr. Silva talked a minute ago about Civitas, about our QEP plan, which will focus on advising. So these are the things we're discovering with our data. Again, it's a tool, not a weapon. And we're discovering, though our numbers are increasing, we need to help them graduate with less hours. Dr. Wilson, this is mm -hmm. one of the slides that I really was holding off on to, to, to comment, but there's, this tells a story, um, and I've, over the years now, um, and just talking about the years here at Del Mar College, you know, I've met with students on a regular basis, that primarily the leadership, but to include around campus and in the community, certainly. Um, what we're talking about is these data represent a protraction, if you will, of their experience and time and life here, their resources their time, their, their, the, the scheduling of, of their lives with, bait, with all of the life stressors. That's what this is. It's a commuter student that's largely full-time, excuse me, largely part-time, and whose uh, hours and, and, and uh, jobs uh, all stretch, their, uh, stretch and stress their lives out over the course of a semester. And so uh, we're going to talk about a few other strategies down the road, but if there's one thing that just has to be addressed here at this college is that protraction of their lives. And I say lives as a collective term to mean all those things that they have to. If you stretch, excuse me, the limited number of dollars that you have as a part-time student out and you stretch it out and you keep stretching it out, um, there's no wonder why you know they're they're, they're taking they're, it's, it becomes a lifestyle, and and despite that we still have great numbers, better improving numbers I should say, um, but that's that's that level of stress um, that we have got to address. You know, we, someone said earlier we're we're we're, we're a, a very nurturing institution. It's always been a very nurturing institution, but that's something that we that's our opportunity to build upon. I, I have a question. That 93 hours, that does not include dual credit or remedial, develop, developmental. Correct. And we've got 77% of our students taking developmental. So if we add in de de developmental and dual credit, what does that, what, 
How many hours are they taking? Yes, it, it'd be well over 100, in, in some cases, um, over 100. And it, um, that's the focusing, see, there's, there's, some, there's some strategies we're gonna talk about um, at the state level and, and certainly here at the local level. Um, and, it, and it also, it doesn't only hinge upon our changing and, and, and uh, adjusting our strategies at the college. It, it is incumbent upon the high schools to work with us and us to work with them to prepare uh, our students at an earlier and earlier age, um, begin to focus and talk about things more focused at the early high school level, even the middle school levels. Um, it's gonna take all of that. Our students are graduating with an associate's degree with almost enough hours to have a bachelor's degree. Correct. That's right. That, that's why it's taken so long. Yes, sir. It's a, and it's also a lifestyle. Okay, as you Correct. ride the economies. It's one we need to change. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Agreed. Agreed. It, it's, it's a lifestyle that they'll ride the economies. Okay, this is a, a, a nationwide trend. When the, when the economy is, when, when unemployment is low, they'll go back to work. When it's high, they'll come back to school. And so they'll ride the economies. Um, and we see that, uh, you can see that through the data. But you're right, we have to change it. You're absolutely right, sir. Do we have a historical look at this data? Yes, it's it's quite consistent. Okay. Mm -hmm. What what I don't my difficulty in this is around the dual credit exclusion. Mm -hmm. Because if if 19% of our students are taking dual credit, some of them finish a degree at at uh, branch uh, and at collegiate high school. So. Mm. A couple of hundred of those every year, or something less than that, maybe 175, complete a community college degree when they graduate from high school. Is that included or not? And then the other couple of thousand students are taking their dual credit courses and either coming here, maybe going to AM Corpus Christi, maybe AM Kingsville, or to other universities, and we're not counting their completion rate. So we're helping them get started with some successful dual credit opportunities, but yet we're not including them in any of our success numbers. So, I, and I realize that we may, I may, may be asking for data that is not, not easy to get, but I think it would be important data for us to understand about the investment that we're making in dual credit, and is that dual credit actually leading to a shortened years to completion or shortened semester credit hours of, of completion, either for an associate's or a bachelor's degree. That's the true measure of whether I think dual, the students who are taking dual credit are trying to apply that to some sort of degree or credential. And are we helping them be successful in that? How do we measure that? Yes, I completely agree. And there is that significant limitation to this measure. We use this measure, again, because this is how the state defines it, and they actually produce this for us. Um, we do need to track our dual credit students um, better. We do, we do track their enrollment. We see how they're doing. But I'd like to see over time, as you're, as you're stating, how does this impact these numbers? What are their graduation rates? I, th I think at the crux of the, the separation of the dual credit students largely has to do with federal reporting Mm. And, and our data. And so the fe federal government does not acknowledge our dual credit students as college students, and that's why our data are aligned as such. Am I, so can, can I clarify, so we don't include dual credit, but we do include dual credit students, did that make sense? So if somebody, somebody from collegiate high school got a degree, did they graduate with zero hours? They're, they're not in it at all. Okay, so it doesn't include, I, I, would I have thought to, it just meant it didn't count those credit hours, but you're saying we don't count them. That I don't two. believe, it's both, I believe. I'll have to double check that, but I, if, okay. if a dual credit student earned a, an associate degree while in high school, I don't think they're even included here. Okay. But if somebody graduates really and has things. dual credit hours, their hours won't be counted. We're aligning our, our base data off of iPads, and I think that's driving a lot of um, why we're filtering out some of the state data from, from uh, our baselines for, for the federal reporting. It's large because of their rules, and um, that's, that's, we're taking notes on all these, yep. on all these issues. And I always want to answer the question. 
I want to answer the questions we're required to answer at the state and federal level, but I want us to really understand and uh, the data as it relates to Del Mar College and what we're doing in our community. And that, that's what I'm frustrated that I'm missing in this piece. Well, well, mm -hmm. well this is, uh, so from, from the reason why I think it, it falls easier on, on, on our ears uh, is because it's, it's almost a, a, a random sampling of sorts. And in research, it's okay to take a baseline and to take a random. And I and I get it. The fuller picture is what we're what we're after, and what we can still what we're still moving towards. I think through the as we get through the presentation, we'll we'll have a few more. Uh, we'll shed some more light on the details that you're referring to. But again, that's what this is. This is baseline. This is an indicator, a primary indicator, albeit. Um, but it's an indicator of our trends, nevertheless, that we have to build upon a foundation. I would say. And it's an excellent discussion for our strategic plan and what are those KPIs we want in there. We'll be, regardless, we'll be sending this data to the state, we'll be looking at it. But if this doesn't tell the whole picture, what else do we need to add to supplement? That's what our plan will have. Correct. All of those KPIs, again, taking off of, from what you're talking about, Regent Scott, um, our data. And that's why we're building our plan for our college. Okay, one more indicator that we talked about back in November that was an issue that we were concerned about was part-time students. We have a very, we have a large percentage of our students enrolling part-time. So in a minute, we're gonna talk about a few strategies we can do to address this. I know we can't, we will always have a large part-time population, but what can we do to help them take an extra class, take an extra couple of classes so they can meet their goal sooner? Okay. Before yes. we move on, I have a question related, not if it's, if it's completion or retention. Um, and I don't know how to capture this data. I think, I've, sure. I think you and I have talked about this before. Mm -hmm. Are we helping a student accomplish their goals? Mm -hmm. So if a student's goal is to take um, six hours in the summer and transfer it back to somewhere, then they're a part-time student of ours, they haven't completed. Does that get captured? Is that in the, the full-time, or does that get captured at Texas A&M Kingsville, or does that get captured for our, our numbers? If they're just coming here as a, what do you call that? Transient, transient, transient student. Um, so that's one example. Another right. example is, is it a dual credit, credit student who uh, wants to get 15, hours, 30 hours under their belt before they go off somewhere else. Mm -hmm. We're helping that student accomplish their goal, but they would never come to us as a first time in college student, mm -hmm. but we help that student in dual credit accomplish their goal mm -hmm. in workforce. And we talked about workforce before. We're helping that student get, get the, the uh, credential that they need, and they may not complete a certificate, uh, but they, so is there a way that we can capture what is the student goal when they come to us and are we helping that student accomplish their goal? Because in a community college, we don't have, many of our students don't come with the intention of a degree. Yes, we, we, we have a, uh, a, a couple of solutions. I'll let Dr. Silva address that as we're uh, embarking upon a new piece of technology. Uh, Regent Scott, we couldn't agree with you more. It is the intention of a student coming in. We have students who come in and want to take anatomy and physiology with us, and their intent is to get into a nursing program at A&M Corpus. So they come and they, they do that, and they are successful and get successful into getting into a nursing program, but then it's seen as a, for lack of a better word, a dropout for us. Uh, but if you look into the qualitative part of it, it was a success because the intent of the student was met. With the new ERP that we're working with Mr. Alfonso is, that is one of the discussions that we've had. Is there a way, because right now we just do Texas Admit, and Texas Admit just says, what do you want to major with us? And so that is the intent. So they say they want to major biology with us. Well, we're going to measure it as, are they going to get a degree at the very end? We don't measure their intent. It's only to come get a few classes with us. And I think that's what you're addressing, Regent Scott. And so we're hoping that we can get a, when we're doing the new ERP, we can get something that can measure that much better in the future. It's a problem that all community colleges have because one thing that community colleges have, the universities don't, we have lots of exit points and is measuring all those multiple exit points that we have that universities do not have uh, that is difficult to measure and sometimes when we see that data, you need to bring it to perspective. Yes. And I think that's what you're asking. I, I just helped a close family friend mm -hmm. with that very example. Young lady seeking the BSN. She already has a bachelor's degree from A&M Corpus Christi. Needed that A&P class. Mm -hmm. Came uh, last 
fall, mm -hmm. took that piece with us, and she is on her way um, to the BSN mm -hmm. on top of the, the B, uh, BS that she already has. Mm -hmm. I, that exact mm -hmm. case yes. happens repeatedly. Yes. Our ERP is the is the opportunity to to set those parameters up sure. and capture that data. Absolutely, yeah. Because everybody, all, all the community colleges in the state, they are the same thing, and we think that's going to be our, our answer. It's also an thing. ongoing conversation at the state. Um, yes, we sir. hear this all the time. Um, it's not anything that's falling on mm -hmm. sympathetic ears, unfortunately. Mm -hmm. But again, it goes back to our local, our local uh, opportunities. If it's a common, if, it, if the data collection or the, those exit points mm -hmm. are a common discussion among community colleges across the state, whether the state asks for, whether the state of Texas asks for that data or not, sure. we all ought to come up with a way to answer that question mm -hmm. and use it ourselves. Again, we're always going to answer the questions we're required to answer, but what are the answers that are really meaningful to the community college community in, in Texas? Or, yeah. So I, I'm going to go back to that point every time. What do we think we ought to be measured by? And let's start talking about those numbers. Yes, we'll answer your question, Mr. State of Texas and Mr. U.S. <laughs> Department of Education, but, but we're going to tell our story based on the data that we know is relevant and true and, and is important to our community. And I, I don't disagree with any of that. I, the, this is the one good thing about the cohort because it is first time, full time, and if someone comes here just to take one class, they're not counted in that cohort. So you're not, you are comparing apples to apples. And it speaks to the spectrum yeah. of our students, kind of the a, a prime examples on both sides. You know, your, your average student taking two classes versus a, a full-time perspective. And then it, th th that's the spectrum that we have to address. And, and, and this particular measure does count them if they graduate anywhere other than Del Mar College. So it depends on the measure. So this particular cohort, first time, full time, and degree seeking. They have to tell us they're seeking a degree from us. If they tell us that, then they're included. And if they graduate with us or anywhere in the state of Texas, they're included in this cohort. So it really just depends on the measure. But I completely agree with you, and I'm so glad that we're taking those efforts to capture student intent, because it's, it's not a perfect system. And as we're developing, as we're hearing you all, we're developing our new KPIs, and this is gonna help us build our new plan. All right, so let's talk about retention, which goes hand in hand with completion. Let's talk about retention rates and then also student classification. So again, our FTIC cohort, what happens to them when they first enroll? So let's look at the fall 2016 cohort after one year. We have a Pretty high, pretty strong persistence rate. Over 60% are with us one year afterwards. Two years out, 50 of them are with us. And for this particular measure, we have also looked at our part-time FTICs and the numbers for, for those particular students are 50% the first year and 30 the second. So we get them here, they stay with us for a while, we want them to keep that momentum up. We don't want to lose them in the beginning. All right. And the next measure, classification of students. 70% freshmen. We have new FTIC cohorts every year. Our students are earning credits. But as we can see from this particular measure, and this is a snapshot from fall 2017. Of all of the credit students enrolled in fall 17, have they earned over 30 credit hours? And the majority haven't. So this goes back to full-time versus part-time. What can we do to help them um, complete more hours more quickly? Our average student takes, what, eight hours of credit every semester? I believe so. So they've got to be here four semesters before they're a sophomore. Right. Right. Mm -hmm. Yep. So let's talk about a few strategies that we discussed back in November and that we're discussing internally here at the college. Eight week terms. There are several colleges in Texas and around the country that are implementing shorter, more compact terms because they're finding that students prefer them. They can be full-time much more easily by taking two classes one term, two classes the next. And any of you who've talked 
courses know that once you get towards the end of the semester, students are tired, you're tired, they tend to drop off. So that's something that we are discussing internally and actually um, piloting this fall with a, with a group of, of classes and we'll be ramping that up and implementing more and more eight week terms every semester. We also are talking about those part-time students, again, eight-week terms, we're hoping that, that will help, but providing those incentives for them to take one more class, letting them know that Pell is available. Um, let's not waste time, get as many classes in as you can. And then finally, advising. We've talked about QEP, Quality Enhancement Plan. For our reaffirmation process, we have to choose a plan that we're gonna work on to improve. And we have found through talking through students, faculty and staff, that advising is what we really want to work on. We have great tools like Civitas, we have great advisors, but we wanna make sure that the help we're providing is consistent across the board and is what students need. Dr. Wilson, if I may jump in. Regents, I, I don't want to just move through this slide because these are major uh, conversations taking place at the college at, and beginning with that eight week term um, notion that we're piloting this fall, um, it's, it's an incredible opportunity, it's an incredible shift in operations here at the college. It will affect every aspect of the college. Um, it is different, we know that. Um, I know, um, I found out that the, there are, there's four colleges now uh, that are onboarding, com uh, that will be a total of four class, uh, colleges that will be onboarding eight weeks um, uh, f more fully than, than, uh, than the uh, pilot that we're doing this fall, and uh, so we'll be the fifth. So others are coming this way. Why are they coming this way? Well, um, because it's, it's proving um, to improve numbers in various aspects. The full-time um, numbers are increasing dramatically. When a student only has to take, in their minds, they're taking two classes at a time. Well, no, not in their minds, in their reality, they're taking two classes at a time, but when they're doing that twice, you have two back-to-back -back eight semester, uh, eight-week semesters, it's a six, you know, all held under the umbrella of 16 weeks. The state is working with us on that opportunity our numbers go up dramatically. They're, they, they're taking smaller bites at the apple. Again, this is going to impact um, uh, the faculty, certainly, uh, uh, staff, uh, our advising components, our financial aid. I mean, it, it has implications throughout. And this, that's why we're seeking to um, wade gently into the water with, with this sort of thing and um, uh, evaluate along the way. This has got to be done correctly. Um, what we're also finding is not just the numbers on the front end are changing with the full-time rates and those uh, as opposed to the part-time, but the other colleges have cycled through it, uh, Odessa, Odessa and Amarillo, but especially Odessa College, albeit a smaller <coughs> college, five or six thousand students on the credit side, um, is experiencing dramatic increases in their graduation rates and their completion rates. Um, I just spoke to the president at Amarillo College day before yesterday in Austin at our quarterly meeting. He's going to be coming this summer to help us with our summer institute to talk about eight weeks. He's coming himself. <coughs> Russell is a very good friend of Dr. Lewis's and mine, and, and he is coming with his staff. Uh, he's also going to allow us to fly over in May, fly a team over to, uh, to go ask all the difficult questions. This is something I really like to hear back from you all on today at some point, if not right now, at some point, so that we can hear uh, the importance of it. You all, Mr. Bennett, you, I mean, it was on the uh, opportunities slide. Um, we, we need to, we, we would like to hear more. We want to, you know, hear about this on an ongoing basis because, again, we're preparing a pilot. I think right now we have about 70 or maybe a little bit more, uh, 80 or so sections. Uh, just to give you a, a, a context or a perspective, we offer a little over 1,200 sections a semester, and we're, we're, we're piloting with the, I was shooting for a 100 to 150. We'll see how, how we get there, but either way, it'll be a nice random sampling, um, and we're going to learn a lot from that, but I'd certainly like to hear from you about this, this particular piece right here. You and I spoke about this about a year ago. Yes, sir. But every seminar I've been to since that time Everybody that has participated in these eight-week sessions, the numbers have gone completely through the roof. 
Yes, sir. So I, I've seen no downside whatsoever. The transition may be rough. Yes, sir. But I see no downside. I, that, that's, I appreciate that feedback. And, and there are lots of opportunities, Regents. You'll be seeing those uh, both state and nationally, but especially statewide at your uh, uh, professional development opportunities uh, to go and take that in. Again, we're bringing experts. And we're going to them. They're, you know, they're, they're all telling me, uh, Russell, Lowry Hart, a president of Amarillo College, was just telling me, he says, you know, Mark, it was, it was painful for every aspect of the college, like every other type of change. And he says, um, he says, but we all look back and say, we wouldn't do it any other way from here on out. Um, you know, those are the kind of um, affirmation, types of affirmation um, that, that are just, that are proven. Uh, their numbers are going up. You know, and I'm just going to say, and it results in um, a, a more prosperous uh, funding cycle, shall we say, or a base year. Their contact hours are improving as a result. So it just means that hard work is rewarded. It's brought back to the college, and those res it generates those extra resources um, to, to support students. Again, it's just a cycle. It's not about uh, money is a, is, is a part of all of this. Um, it's not the reason why we do it, but it is a derivative that is very helpful. Dr. Scumiak, yes, I'm not sure that I understood. I'm not sure that I understood correctly. Did I hear you say that there were five colleges that are doing the eight-week classes? I would four, four col colleges. There's four right now. We will be the fifth, and ours is on a pilot. Now, there's four that are really ramped up. Okay. and, and uh, are doing it with the substantial numbers. I want to say 40, 50 percent to 75 percent thresholds. The lower end, I think um, Kilgore College, I think will go at 50 percent of their credit ratings, uh, credit classes. Um, and I think the highest is 75 or 80 percent, and that's uh, Odessa and Amarillo. Um, it would never go to 100 percent. I would never advocate this be 100 percent. There are classes that don't fit. It doesn't work completely um, on, on, on one end of the spectrum. On the other end of the spectrum, there's, it's been happening for a long time at Del Mar College. There's been both uh, lecture classes, purely lecture classes offered at that eight-week session, and then so, you know, our, our, many of our technical programs are already, already blocked in, those, in that fashion. So uh, the thing is to get it to a, um, a preponderance that is uh, the way we do business, and, and Mr. Bennett, you're, 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 you're your comments are very much appreciated, and um, those are the kind of comments that we're looking for, the kind of feedback. So any more questions? We'd, we'd like to spend a little time on this one. Can, so, can I address advising? Certainly. Absolutely. Uh, Alamo College, they have one counselor for every 350 students. And, of course, their numbers reflect that. Everything's improved at Alamo. We have one counselor for, what, every 1,200 students? It's about three, three times as much, at least, yeah. yes. So, and I think our numbers indicate there's a big difference there. So, yes, based on what I've learned, if we increase the counselors, we get much better results, and the students are, are getting better results as well because they're getting out earlier, and it's costing them less money, and they're borrowing less money. The more human touch um, we can um, provide for our students, uh, the better off um, our students will be. And um, as we look at our QEP as the QEP is really our pilot. It is, it is it, the way the QEP works is we put together a plan and we institute basically a small strategic plan just around that to revamp uh, advising here at the college. It'll be an intensive effort. It is a tr it is a critical component of our reaffirmation of accreditation, and and when we commit to it, it will be robust and it will be very focused on that topic. So there's our opportunity. Uh, funding will have to uh, reflect, and, I th and you and I have also talked about and that. And that's money well spent. Uh, Do that, we know that, that? That's my conclusion. Thank you very Dr. much. Dr. Scumia, one more yes, question. Yes, if these four colleges are being very successful, it just makes me wonder why haven't more colleges jumped okay. on board? So initially when Odessa led the charge in this, uh, Dr. Greg Williams um, um, was the uh, innovator, um, it, it, there, the state would not receive that, would not reciprocate and allow for the reporting. So he had several years of, of recreating, or not recreating, but creating uh, the mechanisms for the state to receive or allow that at the coordinating board. 
So he fought that good fight for us, uh, for the entire state. Led the way, let them, the state let them pilot and let them get started. We were all watching, okay? And we all stood by. And um, a couple of, uh, of the other colleges jumped in sooner. Um, Grayson College, uh, Jeremy McMillan, just talked to him this week as well. He just said, you know, it's, it's, it's easier said than done. Um, but he, ha because he jumped in very quickly as well. Um, so it's just taken, uh, it's taken experience and an evaluation along the way um, to make sure um, that, that mistakes aren't made or mistakes will be made, but mistakes are minimized. Um, you know, they're evaluating things. They're giving us data. We're talking to them. Uh, the example that, that I was told um, that we really need to watch out for is students who live in the two eight weeks, uh, two eight, what, eight week sessions should not also take a 16 week session. You can't live in those two lifestyles um, because those students, the data will show, are not uh, persisting. Um, they're, they're, they're two all over the place um, and so forth. Um, so that's an example. It's, it's got to be, we've got, that's why we have to pilot it and, ex and, and test it ourselves. Um, the other colleges, there are some, like anything else, out of the 50, um, there are some that are just not going to do it, probably, for the foreseeable future. I would not recommend that because what's going to happen is they will be left behind um, in many ways, not the least of which is uh, the completion and the funding opportunities. Thank you. Back yes, to the comment on advising. So if that's part of our strategic plan and part of the uh, SAC COC accreditation QEP, will, at what point will we see what, will it be part of this implementation plan we're gonna review in June or would that be a separate discussion? Um, I, I think the board would like to understand what implementation around advising looks like, and I just want to know when we're going to hear a more robust discussion. Yes, sure. That. So a couple things. Sorry. Uh, a couple things. Um, what I would recommend is that the um, uh, our recommendations for KPIs um, be put together uh, for the plan. Uh, we'll present that to the board, but that we take a deeper dive in the QEP. Um, into a, uh, a presentation. I know we have a we, we already have a SACS update, uh, SAC COC update coming in just two weeks. Mm -hmm. in, in just on the twenty third. Mm -hmm. It's that soon. Okay. Um, <laughs> calendar's getting by, moving fast. So um, don't, don't so worry that, about it now. But maybe that maybe the discussion is between the April board meeting with the SAC COC discussion and the June uh, meeting when we're going to see the implementation plan. Just make sure that the board has an oh, yeah, oh, opportunity. Yes. And, and I can tell you. Definitely advising will be in the, st the strategic plan, but because we are focusing so much on it, we do have a QEP director who's here today. He's going to be working with our stakeholders to make sure that um, that our system meets the needs of the whole college. So that piece takes a little bit longer. So it'll be written in as a priority, but the actual implementation plan will take a little bit longer to develop. And I believe that the goal is to have um, a fully fleshed out plan by um, the end of this fall. Okay. or sooner. Okay. Excellent discussion. Um, we discussed quite a bit at that retreat, and I want to show you through this discussion that these are the priorities that came out. They are still priorities, and they will be in our plan. So thank you for that. I'm going to go through just a couple of more things, and I'll give you a little break. I know we've been talking, talking a lot about many important topics. So the third strategic issue that we discussed at our last retreat was college readiness. Are our students ready to take college courses? Let's first talk about KPIs, how we can measure that, and then some of the strategies that we have in place and that we're proposing. First of all, we want to take a look at the percentage of our students who do require developmental coursework, the percentage of our unprepared students who satisfy TSI, Texas, Texas Success Initiative Assessment. That's a state assessment, the state college left college readiness levels, how many of them um, satisfy those levels within two years, and also how many of them take a college level course within two years. So Regent Rivas asked about this earlier. Our, our FTICs, full-time, part-time, all of them together, our FTICs that come to us, the majority of them require remediation in one or more areas. Most require 
two areas. Um, the area that students need the most help in is math. So as you can see, they're coming to us not ready for college level courses. That in itself is a challenge, quite challenging, that all community colleges struggle with. So let's take a look, again, back to co cohorts. Our FTIC group, which first enrolled in 2015, and you'll see the three different areas of remediation, math, reading, and writing. So for those students who were identified as unprepared, they took the TSI exam, they didn't pass a certain area, how many of them, bless you, how many of them satisfied TSI requirements within two years? And that means either retesting and passing or completing the coursework here at Del Mar to be college ready. Students struggle with math. They really do. As you can see, a lot of them within two years get through reading and writing, but that's two years of time that they haven't been able to take a college level course. That's definitely an area of concern for us and an area that we are working on. And as you can see, um, students struggle with math. What, what is K through 12 doing to correct this or to fix it or to improve it? We are working closely with them. I do, I do know that the state looks at this data. This is a state test. They're informing students of this, um, informing ISDs. There's preparation. There's specific preparation. I don't know if Dr. Escamilla wants to yes, comment. I, we, we, we talk about this a lot in Austin, mm -hmm. and that is what I was talking about earlier um, as the drilling down effect uh, the, into the younger, uh, the, the, the younger ages, certainly high school, but even before high school. Um, I think, I think the through after House Bill Five, uh, at least a couple of sessions ago, uh, since then, um, the conversations uh, at the school districts have begun to change. Um, the um, conversations at the earlier ages about um, choosing a path, selecting um, ideas for their future, uh, is shaping up into policy. It's not just talk. Um, our, our version of pathways, although as, as new as it is to all of us at the state level, <clears throat> excuse me, across the state, um, there's a version of it um, taking place through the endorsements um, at the high school level. Um, so what I'm saying is we have yet, I think we're, we're on the verge of, of, of coupling um, those two big policy issues. Uh, that being HB5 and, and, our, and our pathways, but the intent overall, to answer your question, Regent Rivas, is to, um, is for, the, what we're hearing from the school districts is to have those conversations earlier with them, uh, but not just to have those conversations, but to have those structures in place so that students are uh, thinking about their futures with concrete, uh, with concrete um, programs, I mean actual programs uh, through their high school endorsements. I know that, and I'll just I'll just add that because I have a freshman at home, um, and, and we're feeling that at home. We're seeing it. They're, 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 the expectation is no, no, Benjamin. You must choose a pathway. You must choose a uh, a designation. Um, I keep using the wrong term. We well, must choose an endorsement. That's their word, and so that is I think the that is an update. Of where they are, um, and I and I know from talking to the superintendents that it's gonna it, it's it's good that that is just the biggest the next biggest step. There's many more steps to take to the younger ages to prepare uh, awareness for their for their futures. That's the best way I can answer. Which ISDs here in Corpus in our area are producing better college ready students as opposed to non? We'll have to take a look at that. Well, they have their report cards. Um, mm -hmm. We do know that they have the oh, report right. cards out there. I mean, mm -hmm. that is a baseline. Um, you know, we, you know, our 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 opportunity is we take the top 100 percent, and uh, we and do. So as a mm -hmm. community college, and yes. and so um, you know, that's what we live for, and that's what we uh, we are here for. And uh, and and but but to your point, um, there are other schools that are performing at different rates than others, but uh, we engage them all. Dr. Scamia, when I first got on the board many moons ago, we had some staff from Del Mar that were out uh, collaborating or visiting with the teachers from the high schools working on curriculum. Is that still happening? So, Dr. Lewis, or Dr. Silva, sorry, can you? Yes, it's still happening. 
Yes. Okay. Yeah. Okay. And, and I know I, I, I meet with the superintendents and the principals as well. Um, I didn't want to answer for them. I knew the answer was yes, but um, uh, just know that it takes place at different levels. Um, and to include the younger and younger ages. I know, Doctor, through, through, through our outreach efforts, you know, Valder, as cute as he is, uh, he's very intentional. And it's designed to push that conversation and facilitate that conversation into the younger and younger ages. Thank you. I think this is important that this does come, some of this territory comes with being accessible to all students, regardless of where they graduated in their high school class, regardless of what their, uh, how long it's been since they've graduated. Some of our first time in college student, first time in college students are not 18 years old. They right. might be 20 or 21, and it's been several years since they've had math of any kind. Yes. So I think, so, but our, I think our issue is in two years at Del Mar College taking developmental classes, we still only have 25% who are meeting TSI. Should, should that number be less than, should it be to take them less than two years to reach that goal? Should that, status, should that percentage be higher? Those are things... Yes, we're doing remedial work, but can we do remedial work more productively, more efficiently, more effectively? Yes, exactly. That's our opportunity. We do right. enroll the top 100%. We know that the majority of our students do need that extra help, so it's important to take a snap snapshot of what's happening and what we can do to help them to meet that goal. So if you look on from that same group, these are the students that complete that college level course. So we want them to be college ready and we want them to complete that college level course. So just as you said, Regent Scott, what can we do? What can we do to help them? How can we collaborate with their K through 12 partners? And once they're here, how can we make sure that they, they accelerate um, that attainment? Do you have data on this from other colleges? How do we compare? Have we done that? You know, I didn't bring that, okay. but, but that is available. Okay. Yes, mm -hmm, definitely. So one of the things that we are looking at, there are, this is an issue that's not, that's not just Del Mar College. This is a community college issue and there are many, many schools that are conducting um, studies. They're trying new initiatives and one of the things that has brought to light is to accelerate the curricula. A lot of our students haven't been in school for a while. Maybe they need a refresher. Maybe they just need some supports. Maybe they don't need to take three sequences of courses before taking a college level course. So what our, um, our English and our math departments are currently doing for those students who are, um, who are unprepared but are just under the cusp, they're enrolling them in college level courses and providing supports to them because we want students to be motivated. We want them to see, yes, you can take a college level course and we can provide you with those just-in-time supports to get there. So that is one thing that we're currently doing and we are going to, um, to expand that to more students and that's based on best practice. We did discuss as well um, collaboration with our K through 12 partners. There's a lot of work to be done, but really fine tuning that preparation, that curricula that we can offer here, um, that's our priority. Uh. Dr. Wilson, yes, there is a college, and I, I'm sorry I don't remember, remember the name of the college, that will reimburse the students if they're taking a developmental class and they pass the class, they don't have to, to, to pay for that class. That's a very interesting model. We'll have to if, look at that. If they pass the class, mm -hmm. they'll get reimbursed for the whatever money they pay for that, that class. That could be an excellent motivator. Mm -hmm. We'll have to look at that. That's great. All right. Did, did we miss a slide? <laughs> did we? Unprepared students completed a college level course. I just went through that really quickly. Oh, so maybe I just missed <laughs> it. I did. I'm sorry. I, I want to make sure you all get Wake to up. a break. <laughs> uh, my, my question is, it looks like uh, most of these students aren't even completing a college level course. I, that's, that's my conclusion. Right. And, and I attended a seminar up in New York, and they said they no longer offer remedial courses what they right. do you wear that, that as well yes what they do is put the students the, the unprepared students directly into a college level course and require tutoring their results for those students exceed the normal students yes, yes. so they they take away this two years of, of wasted time and these kids are getting credit yep. and they're excel, they're excelling at it 
better than the normal students. Our, our version of that is the uh, co-requisite model that's up there. Um, it's not the New York, or the, I don't know what state that, that, that came from. It doesn't matter, but uh, the, the, it's not exactly that. But the state did require us to move from the conventional uh, developmental ed process just a few short years ago, if it's not like two years ago or three, um, to the co-requisite model, which requires them to do a version of what you're talking about. So I think the cohort, the new cohort of developmental ed students is 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 just baking. It's only a couple of years old in this co -rec How long have we been doing that? Is Dr. Yes. So, so that model is rolling. It's a version of what you're talking about. Are, are we requiring the tutoring? Instead of tutoring, it's a course. So students are enrolled in the college level course, and then they have a support, uh, a support course attached to it that offers that that tutoring of the college level course. So it's just one? just labeling. Is it a two mm -hmm. one with the lab. Yes. Is it a two-hour class with the lab? So the, the, and refresh my memory here. So basically, the, the, the advising component is built in to a lab scenario within the course. In the IMRF. Yes. Okay. So in effect, it's built in, as opposed to it's a different version of. We're gonna. We're. we're it's. It's. It's uh, newly baked uh, and baking, and we look forward to, to those results. And uh, it is one of our we'll, priorities. We'll bring those back to you. It's your priority, and it's ours too. That's yes. why it's up here. So the last one we're going to discuss is financial effectiveness. There were several strategies that were, that were proposed, and uh, VP Garcia is going to talk about the strategies and proposed KPIs. Well, good morning, everyone. Um, I'm sure you guys are excited about lunch, and this is probably the last thing you guys want to want to talk about. But it excites me, so please bear with me a few minutes here. <laughs> good. Okay, so let's talk about key uh, performance indicators. But before we get started, I want to talk about a little bit of a background on these performance indicators. They are widely used by in, uh, numerous colleges and universities, credit agencies, the Higher Learning Commission, uh, and the Texas uh, Higher Education Coordinating Board to measure the financial health of an institution of higher ed. They are used to measure the college financial health of the institution, but moreover, it provides a narrative around how well an institution is utilizing its financial resources towards achieving is strategic objectives. Today's narrative starts with the fiscal year 2014 and a college that is fisc fisc fiscally sound with the financial capacity to redirect resources towards transformation. This is, a dr this is driven by a positive outlook in the local e economy with investments valued at $50 billion in the coming years. The vision is for transformation calls for investments in a new upgrade to existing gr grounds, a new Southside campus, and a new ERP system. Um, so before we get started, I want to talk about the some of the, uh, the some of the noise behind the numbers. Um, there are two accounting principles that is really impacting. It has a significant impact in in our ratios. It is the uh, Post-employee pension, GASB 68, and other post-employee benefits, GASB 75, with a total value of $97 million. Now, KPMG's position 
on the accounting changes, and I quote, it does not affect the credit of an institution and management should never, never manage to accounting regulations. In addition, the Texas Higher and Education Coordinating Board, who uses a slight variation of the same ratios, is considering adopting this position. So for the time being, this presentation includes the impact of the accounting change. And I'll highlight those for you throughout the process. Okay. So let's get started with return on net position ratio. It is used to measure the college's annual surplus uh, that is added to the college's net position. Kudos to the team here. Um, for the five-year end, the college experienced a ratio ranging from four to two that is driven by a total surplus, a cumulative surplus of $43.9 million. For fiscal year, this, uh, this anomaly, fiscal year in 2018 was an anomaly uh, with a rate of 22% due to the accounting change that I just mentioned, GASB valued at 97. However, if we were to exclude this adjustment, the ratio would normalize to 8.1. I wanna point out something that's gonna be uh, very evident throughout the slides. by the CB. Oh, thank you. Thank you. So as you can see here, we've exceeded, even after that accounting change, we've exceeded that expectation in all five years. Moving on. Uh, on the 2018 net position increased by $9.9 .9 million. Is that before or after? SB 75. So fiscal year 2018, is that what you're referring to? Yes. yes. So, so yes, it, it shows that we had to return our, our investment, a really 22%. That's what it's showing. And so it's being skewed. Why? Because we took a big hit in the net position because of the accounting change of 96 million. So it shows a higher rate of return on, on your position. But the note says, <clears throat> after the new GASB. Isn't it before the new GASB? No, that 22%. That, I'm sorry, the, the note, physical, physical year in 2018 net position increased by $9.9 .9 million. It didn't increase by $9.9 .9 million. It decreased. No, it did not. So where's, that. Where's the GASB 75 at? Yeah, so GASB 75 is a, a direct hit to your net position position. When we talk about the surplus, the increase, it really went up by nine, um, by nine million. If you look at the audit financial statements, Mr. Bennett, our revenues exceeded our operating expenses by $9.9 .9 million. However, that adjustment of 96 million went directly to net position, skewing this number. So essentially your annual performance was stellar in 2018, even after this big hit of $96 million, which skews the return on your net position, it, it, it sort of distorts, distorts the number, if that helps. <clears throat> I'm still confused on it. Sure. I mean, we can probably meet uh, after this, and I can show go over the numbers. We had, we had $75 million in additional cost in 2018 because of GASB 75. Uh, well, that's the thing. It, it hit the net position. It did not impact our operations. And I'm not too sure if I can show our RF financial samples. I'm gonna try to do that here. And I'll point it out for you. As a matter of fact, uh, why don't you and I have a discussion afterwards okay. and I'll point it out for you. But it is clear in our audit financial statements that we increased our net position Thank 
increase in net position? Net position at the end of the year, a decrease. For the period ending 2018. Okay, I'm looking 9. at this 9. number. You're looking at that number, I'm looking at this number. Yep, so two different, two different points of reference. Annual surplus, 9.9 .9 million, and this is your net position right there. Year over year change is your 98 million to net position. But our operations was very successful that year. Okay, so it's semantics on my part. <laughs> sure. <laughs> Definitely, yes. Yeah, the, I mean, the, the point being is there's so many ways of looking at this data. Mm -hmm. Okay, sorry. Uh, to your point, Mr. Bennett, there's so many ways of looking at this data. And so uh, I think there's been discussions throughout this presentation is how do we measure ourselves? What is the data point of reference? Do we look at, you know, those units of measures that we are compared to other institutions or do we design our own? Okay, so moving right along. Next is the new operating rev revenue ratio. It's, it is used to use the effective use of current annual revenues. The college reported a surplus in four of the five years for a combined total of 38.9 million. This is excluding fiscal years 2017, which by the way, we added 5 million. Uh, fiscal year 17 was an anomaly, or what impact that number, uh, more than anything else, was uh, the increase in our operations. Uh, specifically, we've added $5.4 million in, um, in instructional cost, uh, mainly funded to, to fund salaries. And then we also ha um, had a reduction in our, uh, our uh, grant revenue as a result of completion of grants. At the end of the day, uh, or a good example of that was the uh, $4.3 million fund funded by the Federal Emergency Management uh, that pretty much got completed. That was for the completion of the emergency training building uh, out in our West Campus. So we still had the financial capacity to continue to build uh, for these, uh, for a specific programmatic initiative. Now. So why, why is this ratio important if it does not include ad valorem? <laughs> tax revenue? Yes, so essentially the debt service tax re revenue piece, the, the CB's position is that it is a separate source of funding uh, for the general obligation bonds. And so they, they, they pretty much says, let's put that aside. The reality is how well are you performing uh, overall to fund your operations with your tuition, uh, your, revenue bond, uh, your revenue bond obligations. So it's really focused okay. on a specific point. Yes. But for, but for community colleges, our ad valorem sales tax revenue is part of our operating revenue. That's the way we are set up by the state of Texas. That is correct, yes. And so, so I'm saying, why does this mean anything to us if it doesn't include <laughs> ad valorem tax revenue? Yes, well, it is important, I will say this. But there's two components to the ad valorem, right? There's the operating piece, and then there's the debt service. What is oh, this including? Is debt, this excludes debt service. Yes. yes. I'm so sorry. Yeah. Yes. I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry. Yeah. Sure. <laughs> I'm so sorry. I completely yes. read that. I apologize. Good. Withdraw we'll the question. Yes. <laughs> no, no, I find this is very difficult. I mean, sometimes I have to pause and right, really yeah. put my thoughts together, and so this is yeah. not very easy. I get it. Yes. Yeah, these, these are KPIs that are that are used by the coordinating board that we're, we're being measured by, and, and, uh, and we find them useful. And we think, um, again, this kind of feedback is, is uh, tempering um, our use of, the, uh, of, of these uh, KPIs as the basis to evaluate ourselves. And we wanna, you know, your, this conversation, there, there are no bad questions for us. No, not at all. We're I, gonna learn I welcome, from, absolutely. No matter, no, no matter what question it is, we're gonna learn from you all um, how this can be used um, to set up our, our, our fiscal part of our plan. Yep, so in fiscal year 2017, you know, we, we saw a, a dip in there because of completed uh, grants and contracts. So what does that mean? What did that, that translate to us? Well, there's a, there's a grants plays a, a, an important role to our operations. And so strategically, what are we doing today? 
Well, we're re assessing our current grant operations and making changes so that we can continue and go after grants in the future. And more than anything else, be strategic in the type of grants that we target. I know STEM is important, uh, workforce is important to us, so really adding value in how we target those, uh, those, those grants contracts down the line. All right, primary reserve ratio. So the CB puts a lot of weight into this particular ratio. Uh, what it is is used to determine the number of months uh, the college can continue to operate into the future with existing financial resources with no additional revenue. The college's financial resources is, was sufficient to fund four to six months of operations in four of the five fiscal years. With respect to fiscal year 2018, uh, the results, once again, is influenced by this GASB adjustment. Uh, if the college were to exclude this accounting change, as suggested by KPMG, the ratio would normalize to a ratio of 0.45. Once again, exceeding CB's expectations. Okay? Uh, oh, and one important thing to mention here. The college board policy, 4.1.1, relating to fund balance requirements uh, requires the college to maintain an operating fund balance level of approximately three months. Uh, this, uh, the college adherence to this policy has significantly contributed to the strong financial condition of this institution. So kudos to the, to the uh, leadership of this organization. Very, very well done. Is that just a board policy, or are we mandated by the coordinating board to have that three months? You know, I, I don't know the I, answer I, to it, that. So it is, it is a board policy. It is um, um, a standard that is recommended um, that many colleges do not achieve, I will say. Um, it is not. Uh, we carve it in our own stone, so to speak. And... Um, but it is best practice. Uh, from the accreditation standpoint, uh, we will be evaluated on fiscal operations as well, and there too, um, we will be um, uh, evaluated on, on that three-month ba uh, three basis, yeah. uh, unless that's changed. I don't believe it has. That's correct. Okay. And so what you see here is, is a, a, a sound financial organization that's gonna, that, that allows for agility. Any business interruptions that may come back, we are able to manage it uh, a little bit better than other organizations. Okay. All right, viability is probably the next uh, largest uh, uh, weight that the CB uh, focuses on. Uh, it is used to measure the college's financial ability to pay the entire long-term obligation. Uh, the college's financial reserves was sufficient to pay 100%, 100% of the long-term obligations in four of the five reported fiscal years. Fiscal year long-term obligations include $13.9 million in revenue bonds and accrued employee absences. It also includes all of the general obligation bonds, or excludes, I'm sorry, excludes the general obligation bonds. Why? Because that is a separately funded tax ad valorem that, uh, that, that we, we assess taxpayers. So we're excluding that piece. With respect to fiscal year's 2018 results, once again, uh, you know, it's being influenced uh, by this new accounting principle. Um, and so if we were to net that out or take that out, we would have a positive ratio of 2.52. What does that mean? I can pay my outstanding obligation twice. That is, that is fantastic. I say fantastic because I'm coming from an organization that had some financial um, challenges, you know. So, very good. Good place to be. Yeah. All right. So, last item. Composite financial index. All right, this index is used to measure the overall financial condition of the college. It is based on the weighted average of all these ratios that we just talked about, the last two being heavily weighted on. 
should not come to anyone's surprise that 2018 in index is influenced by, uh, by the employee pension and other post-employee benefits. Um, the exclusion of these uh, numbers, we would have a, a rate of 4.6. As I started my presentation, our narrative starts with a composite index of 4.5, which according to the Higher Learning Commission would suggest a forward strategy for transition. Here we are today. The college is completing a number of capital projects while ramping up other projects such as the Southside Campus and a new ERP system. In addition, this vision and forward thinking has resulted in a New workforce partnerships. I'm, I'm going to try to say this correctly. Gulf Coast Growth Ventures. <laughs> Donation to the college for $1.5 million uh, is our most recent, ex recent example. So very nice. When you do a good job and when you demonstrate sound stewardship of financial resources, this is what happens. Very good job to everybody in this room. Very nice. Okay. So I've covered a lot of material today, but I want to have to say that the key takeaway from this presentation is number one, the college planning has been around financial agility that resulted in surplus of approximately $45 million from 2014 to 2015 to hedge any business interruptions. What are those business interruptions in the past five years? Number one, Hurricane uh, Katrina. F Harvey. Harvey, I am sorry. We Thank just you. talked about that this morning. Yes, we did. <laughs> Wrong storm. Uh, my iteration of Back to the Future, I'm sorry. Uh, uh, and so that cost us $1.5 million right there alone. The accounting change for $96.8 million, guess what? 48% of that, almost 50% of that was covered by this buildup of reserves over the five years. Very nice. Uh, I think I had a question around, um, you know, what made up that $1.5 million uh, cost in Hurricane Harvey. It consists of a uh, $475,000 hit to our tuition and fee for that fall term, $240,000 in damages to our physical plant, approximately $700 in salaries that we made a collective decision to pay out as we close the building. And then $80,000 in special student financial assistance, kindly given to us by the foundation. So, adaptability, flexibility in our financial resources, very strong. Kudos to everyone. Uh, and then, second of all, we have a proven track record of meeting or exceeding the CBE standards. So again, Great job, everyone. I can't take credit for this. I wish I could. Sorry about that. But very nice. Well done. Your presentation. Thank you, Mr. Garcia. That presentation gives us the uh, a great overview. It's a uh, it, again. It is based off of statewide uh, assessment of our financial operations here at the college. Uh, we'll continue to um, elaborate on these KPIs. If there are any thoughts, questions, or ideas, please give them to us. Um, again, I think the other takeaway, or I think the big takeaway is despite the weighted effect, um, the burden, if you will, of Gasby 68 and 75, we're still doing exceedingly well with that included. And yet we are still offered the opportunity of removing it so that it doesn't affect um, uh, various aspects of our, of our finances. Yes, uh, Mr. Pres President, thank you for bringing that up. Hot off the press this morning before yes. walking into this meeting, I got wind that the CB is going to the board with their latest report on assessing all the different colleges, and it excludes uh, these GASB adjustments. So, great news. Thank you. We talked about completion, retention, college readiness, and financial effectiveness. Those are your strategic issues. I hope that you feel that we captured what we discussed back in November. Again, we're still fine tuning what this is gonna look like within our plan. Again, 
as Beth mentioned, you can call them various things, but strategic issues are the basis from which we will be building the rest of our plan. But we don't want to do that um, only with, with your feedback. We want to make sure that we talk to our students, our faculty and staff, and the community. So when we return from a five minute break, Dr. Lewis and Dr. Silva will be sharing information from students and faculty and staff. So let's take a brief five minute break. Thank you. Surveys, we had mentioned surveys in last fall, and we did uh, over 450 students and over 125 alumni, and they said they, the satisfaction rate with academic advising amongst our students, they were 63% uh, satisfied with it, 6% not satisfied. Our alumni was very similar, 62% satisfied with our academic advising, and 11% not satisfied with financial aid. It was 65% satisfied among our students and 6% not satisfied. And our alumni, it, uh, it's a little bit different, 46% satisfied with 11% not satisfied with our financial aid services. And our library services, like I mentioned before, our students were 81% satisfied with the library services and our alumni 80% satisfied with our alumni services. So that's a snapshot of our focus groups and of our surveys that we send out. Um, any questions before I, I wrap up my portion of it here? We've been talking quite a bit about what's to come. Uh, guided Pathways, you've heard Guided Pathways before. Uh, Dr. Lewis and Dr. Wilson are spearheading that, that, uh, that initiative. It's going to be a game changer for our students and it's gonna impact our time to completion and hours to completion. Uh, you'll be getting more information on guided pathways at a future upcoming uh, board meetings. Same thing with advising, our QEP, Dr. Anderson, and you'll hear more of a uh, Letitia Wilson, which would be assisting Dr. Anderson and helping with Dr. Anderson, Anderson on our QEP uh, regarding advising. We know from our conversations this morning how important advising is for our students, and so we are gonna take a deep dive into our advising. Dr. Yes, Silva, I'd just like to say really quickly, I, I don't want to move too fast through, I want to move quickly, sure. but the, um, the piece of um, the pathways conversation, I'd like to touch on and hear from the regents or, sure. or, or provide more information for the regents. You know, this is a, another big, big shift and it's taking place at the state and it's taking place at this Texas uh, Success Center um, at the Texas Association of Community Colleges, okay? And it's um, being implemented throughout, um, uh, I think all 50 colleges are on board now. Um, I think the last two just came along. Uh, we were at about the, I, well, a little bit past the middle. We weren't, we weren't quite at the top 50%, but nevertheless, um, we're well into this, um, um, I think, revolutionary change at the college. It is a lot of change, and we know that change does not come easy, but the importance of it really stems from um, several uh, legislate, legislative sessions back. 
uh, when the, the whole notion of intrusive advising began to spawn and the, and, and the state at, at the same time as the state a legislature saying we're not going to fund inefficiency anymore we're not going to we don't want anything past 60 hours what happened they knocked us back to 60 hours okay squared off, squared us off at 60 hours we were offering uh, programs at 72 76 even 78 hours if I, if I recall correctly um, because again they were they were taking even many more hours than they currently are uh, at the 60 level um, and so the state is a, is working with us my my big point with this is the state is working with us right now and I just had a meeting with the department chairs and our deans I think it was last week and and, and to talk about this very thing this is our chance to work with uh, the association of the Texas Student Success Center and and other colleges to formulate pathways and define it for ourselves because I We'll make this prediction now that it will be legislative, legislated in future sessions. Why? Because a statewide initiative like this will only sustain itself um, if it is legislated according to the powers that be. Okay, this is our chance to create what works for us. That's not saying that they won't put their hands on it in the future, but this is a chance to get ahead of this thing, build it, assess it, and prove it prove or improve uh, its worth over the next several years. Um, we're working with, uh, um, our, again, our, 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 our deans and department chairs. Um, it is a change. Again, change is change. Um, I, it, this, and this will be one more topic at my college-wide meeting as I address um, the, the, all those who are able to, to make that meeting at the college, but I think that's really important. And if you have any feedback on that, we'd like to hear from you on this one. I do. Mr. Uh, the Pathways, we attended a seminar uh, earlier this, this spring. Yes, sir. And um, the Pathways, once we reduce the, the time it takes to get through to, to approximately 60 hours, we're backing off from our now 93 plus hours to 60 hours. So. We're reducing the contact hours by more than a third. Yes. And that's going to reduce our revenue as well as our enrollment. So, and, 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 and the idea is to counter that um, both legislatively and operationally uh, through success points. And so as we advocate or are advocating right now for the increased revenues being put, uh, in, our, in our overall uh, pot of appropriations, everybody, well, let me just say, the legislature is preferring to put more monies. Uh, currently, we're sitting at 75, plus 75 million at the legislature for all colleges right now. The majority of those dollars are put into success points, and they're, increased, and they're looking for us to compete for those dollars, okay? And so that's how we can begin to offset it. I don't think it would replace it completely, um, to your point, uh, contact hours, you, you, you can't just sit here, generate contact hours, make money that way and, and, and not have outcomes. We, we, will, we will tweak and adjust, evaluate as we're moving along, Mr. Garcia, as we're moving along and watching our, our student success points increase as they are and balance that with the offset from our contact hours. We will watch that. Um, at the end of the day, that's a problem we're, we want to have. More completers, more graduates, um, even at the cost of less. I, I agree, dollars. that's a good thing to have, but we, we probably need that five-year plan that Mr. Garcia is about three years behind in preparing. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. You've been here seven months, Mr. Garcia. <laughs> Come on, get with it. Yeah. Sure. Duly yeah, noted, and, sir. Yeah. And Dr. Escamilla, if I can bring up one, one other thing, is we also want to be retaining our folks also longer. So you also have that component of retention where it would add keeping students here longer, keeping that revenue point here longer as well. performance, right? And so what we're doing today is moving in the right direction. We're preparing ourselves for the time when the state's going to come back and say, guess what? 
your funding is going to be based on 50% of the funding. I'm not saying that's where they're going. Well, it is. But, it, it is. but it's a good direction. We're doing it today. We're forward thinkers there. Yes, we're going to get hit a, couple, a little bit in the, in the short term, but in the long, long run, it's a good business decision. On top of that, we need a, you know, the $50 billion investment in the local economy. Yes, our credit hours today, production, is, is going to probably ramp up. You know, population growth. You know, the new jobs is going to attract a lot of young families out here. That's our future growth. And we need to be ready. We need to have that financial flexibility, the vision, our, our operations geared towards that. And I, I agree with everything you said, um, with one caveat is that, and we've discussed this several times, uh, the, the finances are going to be tight at an 8%, and we're still battling, I think, that 2.5%. So our finances are going to be tight before we have a reduction, we're clearly going to have a reduction if this is successful, and I think it will be. So there will be a reduction in revenue, both tuition and state funding. So a temporary reduction on an already tight forecast. Uh, not, not a really good thing to have to address. Hot off the press this morning, um, it was, um, the, that bill was tabled uh, this morning. Um, as it was going to be reviewed from the House side on the tax cap, um, I think uh, I forget why. Uh, no, I don't know why. There was uh, some other other introductions of some other bills that uh, have slowed the process down. We thought we were going to learn something more about the tax cap bill um, this afternoon, but that that wasn't the case. So there's a uh, stalled effect effect. Uh, that I was, uh, not my words, but uh, that, that I was uh, advised of first thing this morning um, for things that happened very late last night at the legislature. Stay tuned. I'll have a report on the 23rd. If they stall in another 100, 140 days or so, we'll be okay. <laughs> <laughs> uh, the special session only makes it more complicated. Mm -hmm. I have two comments, uh, one related to what Mr. Bennett just said. So perhaps whether it's embedded in the five-year financial plan, uh, but, but there probably ought to be a discussion around capacity and marketing to fill that capacity. If we end up with excess capacity, then is, are there, we know from 60 by 30, no, 30 by, yeah, 60, 60 by 30, 30. <laughs> um, that there is, there are citizens within our service area who have not, who don't have a post-secondary credential or degree. So there's, there's capacity in, for marketing there. And then obviously with, with potential growth in that high school age that's buffeted by demographics. But the point is there's marketing opportunities for us to fill seats if we end up with excess capacity. And perhaps that ought to be one of the strategic initiatives, again, whether it's a second layer buried somewhere, but, but we ought to be thinking about that in a five, from a five-year strategic planning standpoint. Uh, another niche, I, I have to put this out there, and it's, it's still baking, and I'm gonna, we're going to have a full and robust plan, uh, report at the May meeting, probably at a workshop, we think, um, on facilities. Another niche that established this college in its early days, primarily in the art performing performing arts area, is housing. We have to look at that, and we have some opportunities that are relatively, no, that are very low hanging fruit, um, that can get us started in that niche because those students will come from uh, other places, uh, which means we can, like we did in Tyler, we when we were at Tyler because of the thousand beds, the residence halls, we we were able to advertise all over the state because our mission wasn't just local. It was statewide uh, because of those programs, those unique programs. Now, you got to be real careful with that. But, that. but that being said, that is a niche that built our music programs and our fine performing arts. And when we reduced or uh, re, uh, eliminated those beds, that program contracted decade by decade. And it's, 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 uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a good size now, but we, everybody wants it to grow. That is our opportunity. So when we see those kinds of those kinds of tactical plans in the implementation plan, is that part of yes. what's going to be included? Yes. Okay. Yes. And we, the, we, mm -hmm. the other comment that I had was specifically related to advising. I want to build on something that uh, Mrs. Strada said uh, early in the, the meeting, that the, the culture that we care about our students 
Um, it is, I think, something to be embedded in, this, in the advising QEP. You know, we, we, we care about you. We care about your goals. We care about what you want to accomplish, and we want to help you get there. And so, so I, I am very much aligned, as I think I haven't heard anybody say that they're not, in the work that we're going to be doing around advising. So I think you have our, our support in that. And going back to we care. We care. From this level to the janitor, <laughs> we care about our students. Another word on excess capacity. We have excess capacity, but it's at the wrong hours. So we've got to do something to address changing the hours to, to utilize the buildings. I, I, I've, um, am having a, a more, in, I had a meeting with our, our um, scheduling software group last week. I met with their executives. Um, we're drilling down deeper. Uh, I, I will tell you that we are, that I had a basic analysis done of our scheduling for our students, course scheduling, class scheduling, and <clears throat> the good news is that we're, like a lot of other colleges, uh, we're, we're not off one way, but that's our opportunity also, um, is to change that. Again, uh, we're, meeting our, we're meeting our culture's needs. We're meeting the demands of what our students are asking for based on what we have today. Um, the eight-week is going to change that culture. Um, certainly, if as we ramp up and as I've been able to introduce the idea of, of residence halls, um, it'll change. I'll, I'll also say that I talked to uh, the re now retiring uh, president of one of the colleges who has many, many beds, and I talked to him about, about that idea, and he says it's make, it makes all the difference in the world to the institutions. It changes everything. Um, including as a starting with your uh, completion rates and so forth. So two thoughts that are coming your way. Thank you, sir. So Rito talked about the student perception. I get to talk about the faculty and staff perception, and the good news is that you do a gap analysis, there's not a lot of difference, which is kind of exciting, that the things that the students are picking up on are the same values that faculty and staff are putting out there. So very quickly, um, we had six fo focus groups in February, and about 50 faculty and staff participated, but we also did an online survey, and that data is just now being pulled in, and we'll have more of that available to you um, very quickly. So, as we said, Del Mar College, very good at student support. We love our students. High quality degrees and certificates, affordability and accessibility, all good things we want community colleges to be. High, um, hiring, caring, qualified faculty and staff, and community relations and brand identity, all good stuff. So, nothing that jumps out there that we need to be particularly alarmed about. So here are some opportunities, some things that we can change and improve. Internal communication is always going to be an issue. Um, here specifically is cited between employees and between departments. Advising, there it is again, right? It is the, uh, it is the hot topic. Uh, the ERP um, with the student information system, other resources. Distance learning, the supports and processes that go along with that. How can we best expand that to serve students and make it work? Um, our student outcomes, there it is, graduation and transfer rates. We started the morning talking about that. And then facilities and maintenance because it's an older campus, but we've got the newness coming in, we've got renovations planned, and uh, we're always looking at how can we leverage that. So we ask our students and faculty, what do you think the challenges are that our students face? First thing that they said, was being academically unprepared for college. I think our data showed that earlier, um, that we have a lot of students who have to take a lot of developmental education. Obviously, we've got some socioeconomic challenges, some lack of resources we always talk about. We've got students who are one flat tire away from dropping out of school, right? You have one thing that happens to them, it knocks them out of the game, literally. The life college balance, I'm, I'm not sure any of us have figured out the life-work balance, and so the life-college balance shouldn't be a surprise for us. Students struggle with it the same way that we struggle with it. Course scheduling, now this is something we absolutely can fix, and as Dr. Escamilla just said, um, you know, it's, it's 
tough for some students to build an efficient schedule. Um, some of the courses might be unavailable because they're only offered in fall or they're only offered in spring and students need them in the alternate semester. So we're looking at all of those things. We're looking at um, what um, are common start and, and end times that we can pull together so that students can put together a full schedule and not have a three hour break between their first class and their second class. Students don't like that. And then we ask, what do you think Del Mar needs to prepare for? Well, obviously, program growth was number one. The dual credit, the online offerings, the emerging industry needs. Um, students taking more classes online. We saw that earlier in a slide back that we need to get our online distance ed. Some of those processes worked out pretty quickly. There's that new ERP again, that student information system. And then automating processes, both for students and for internal efficiency. You know, we still have uh, a lot of opportunity to improve some of the business operations that we do. Okay, next five years, what's coming up on the horizon? Well, funding always. We always sort of hold our breath for at least 140 days every other year uh, because we never know what's going to happen. You know, we may have the best plan in the world, and then we have a legislator or two who decide, eh, not so much, let's do it this way. And then we've got to start back at square one. Uh, obviously, keeping up with growth. Growth is exciting. It's terrifying. It's an opportunity. But there's a lot of work that has to go into that. Um, we have um, a lot of faculty and staff who might be thinking about retiring. We, we are very, very blessed in that we have faculty and staff who come here and stay. That's a wonderful thing to have, that institutional knowledge, that institutional history. We don't have a lot of people who uh, flit in, flit out. And so the, the problem with that, if there is a problem, is that they all tend to hit retirement age about the same time, and so we lose a lot of folks at once. Um, and then we are, we are in nothing but change right now with new strategies, with pathways, with our new ERP, with QEP, with everything else that can be happening. We're all doing it at once, and uh, if we survive this, we can survive anything. Um, but it's exciting times. Now, we have not had community meetings yet to ask them the same questions that we ask students and faculty and staff. That's going to be coming up in a matter of a few weeks, about a month from now, I think. Um, and we'll keep y'all advised on when that's going to be, and certainly would like for y'all to uh, participate in that if you can. At this point, we are going to take about 10 minutes, let you grab a plate, bring it back to your desk, and then we'll continue moving on through here because we have about an hour left and we've got some work to do. So 10 minutes, lunch is in the corner back there. Uh, grab what you need and then we'll reconvene. Thank you. Okay, we are going to attempt to have a working lunch. So if we can crunch our tortilla chips quietly, <laughs> or at least at least turn your microphone off, and we're gonna let uh, Dr. Wilson continue. Nothing says uh, vision statements like taco salad. <laughs> okay, so we're going to continue. And we spent some time this morning rehashing what the different parts of our strategic plan are going to contain. And the piece that we want to focus on this afternoon is our vision. As our regents, you play a key role in helping to define what we want to be, what role we want to serve, and what capacity we will reach in five years. So we're going to start with vision, then talk about mission and core values, and, and that'll be the end of the day. As we started our discussion this morning, this bottom piece of the pyramid is the foundation. It's so important to know what our strategic issues are, how we're gonna measure them, what we're gonna do, but if we don't know the direction where we're headed, if we don't have that solid mission, then the rest is all for naught. So we're gonna spend the rest of this time talking about our mission, values, and vision. And as I mentioned, we're gonna start with vision 
because this really is one of the most important components of our plan. I know we can sometimes get vision and mission um, mixed up, interchanged, because they, they can seem so similar, but the vision is really forward thinking. It's meant to be aspirational and what we hope to be um, in the future and the role we, we wish to serve in the community. It's what we aspire to achieve. So this is the piece that, that we believe that you as regents play such a key role in in setting that tone for us. So I know this is gonna be a little complicated because we have, we have our lunch in front of us, but we'd like for you to participate in a short little activity. And Lucy, Dr. Lucy James is gonna be helping us with, with this, but we wanna know what vision do you have for the college? What words capture that vision? We provided some resources to, for you in your green folder. There are some sample vision statements on one page and also on the back of this page, our steering committee went through a similar activity where they, where they identified the words that they thought best, best captured the direction where we're heading. So you have those to take a look at. So I'm gonna hand it over to Lucy. She can talk about this activity. So as Dr. Wilson said, we did ask our steering committee to begin thinking Five years down the road, what is it we want Del Mar College to be? What words, what phrases would we use that would express what we want Del Mar to be? And so um, you, they do have, you have index cards. And here's an example. If you could write kind of large on your index cards and one word or phrase per card, you should have multiples, words that express that would kind of express your vision of Del Mar College. Five years from now, what is it we want to say, this is what Del Mar College aspires to be? And um, I'll give you a few minutes to write. And so like, you can write with one hand and eat with the other if you're ambidextrous or <laughs> however you can handle this. If you would just take a few minutes and write um, some words or short phrases that would express your vision of Del Mar College. Um, right, when we did it with committee, we kind of did this as a group, but we're asking you to do this and we're going to ask you to kind of work together to compare your words. So if you have several words, um, yes, that's why you can get the multiple um, index words. The other thing is, um, if you wouldn't mind, I think we've put markers around, but um, we are going to eventually post some words to kind of have everybody look at them. So if you could um, use a marker, that might make it a little easier too.
And now I'm going to give you a second challenge to do if you're still eating, too. Easier if you finished. Um, so if you will kind of pair up and compare your words and maybe prioritize them. If you can kind of, between the two of you, like whoever you're paired up with, figure out like which words would the, be the most important words that you would want to say describe Del Mar College as we look at our vision for five years from now. Okay, I, I really hate to cut you off, but in the interest of time, what we're going to do is um, I'm going to come and collect, and you can decide the top two or the top three from your pair. We're going to put them over here on the whiteboard and save them. We'll come back to them again. But I'm going to turn this back over to Dr. Wilson while I come and collect your top two or three. All right. While Lucy posts our visionary words, we're going to shift gears a little bit and talk about our mission and core values. Very closely related to our vision, but quite different. Again, mission statement is the foundation of our entire plan, and it describes why we exist and what we're here to do. Mission statements tend to be definitional. They may not capture words like you've, like you've articulated and we'll, we'll look at in just a minute. The words, the aspirational, the future thinking, mission statements are, are, are purely functional. And tell us this is what we're here to do. 
Our accrediting body, SAC COC, also has some specific language of what they look for in our mission statements. They want our mission statements to be clearly defined, comprehensive, and specific to our institution. So it's important that our mission statements reflect exactly what we do and the role that we serve in the community. Dr. Wilson, if I may. Sure. Regent Scott, your statements earlier um, about creating data, be, you know, focusing on our needs locally, this is our opportunity to represent um, that very notion of creating um, um, a, a college for us. Uh, yes, we care about the state. Yes, we care about the DOE as much as we have to. We care as much or more about our local stuff. So this is our opportunity. Yes, definitely. The steering committee has been looking at best practices, what SACS is looking for, what SCUP recommends, and we've come up with a proposed mission statement that's a little different from our current mission statement. So we'd like to, to uh, have you take a look. It's a little long, so we broke it up here to make it a little bit easier to, to visualize, but in your green folder, I re recommend that you pull out the document that says proposal for 2019-2024. And in, in the spirit of defining what we are here to do, this is what the committee came up with. Del Mar College is a multi-campus community college that supports the academic, workforce development, and lifelong learning needs of its community by offering degree and certificate programs, continuing education opportunities, adult education services, and customized training for economic advancement. It's what we do. It's a mouthful. but it meets that, that purpose. Again, Regents, and this is our opportunity, as, uh, this is you all's opportunity as Regents to, to say, we shelled something out that, that hit the prescriptive types of things so that we can, um, as, as our strategic planning committee uh, met, to make sure we, we checked um, the necessary items off uh, for this part. Um, our offering today is to say this is a, a, a a very solid version, we think, that again, talks about who we are, um, but we also can adjust, and we would like your opinions. Am I wrong on that? Yes, no, you are, you are perfectly right. This is a proposal that came out of the committee. One of the things that we also discussed within the committee is the fact that before every board meeting and at all of our opportunities, we like to recite our mission statement. In discussing mission, vision, what's the fit, what is the statement that's going to, to help guide us in our actions? It was discussed that maybe, though this fits the definition, this fits the best practice, it could be that our board may feel more comfortable using a statement that focuses on the vision, that focuses on the future to start the board meetings with, if that, if that, meets, your, if that meets your needs. That's one of the things that we stuck on. This mission statement, it's precise, it lists everything that we do, but it's prescriptive. It's not, yeah. it's prescriptive, right, right. It meets that need, but it may not serve your needs for how it had been used previously. So I can't help but compare this to our existing mission statement, which is on our agenda and which, which we recite every time. And the, the, the first phrase of that, I think, encompasses uh, and adds to the existing mission statement. So I appreciate the fact that it's not a major departure from. It is, it in a lot of ways, is consistent with our, our current mission statement. Um, the multi-campus, I think, is important uh, to, to begin to define ourselves in that way. Mm -hmm. the, the two pieces that I think are different and whether or not they, they warrant a lot of discussion is up to the board, is the piece around providing access versus supporting that, that, that is a, a strategic difference in, in those two phrases. And then student and community success versus learning needs or versus needs of the community. So there, there's something in the current mission statement about success that it's not just supporting that, 
but it is looking for our students to be successful. The phrase student and community success, uh, I think is part of what promotes us to continue looking at completers, looking at graduation rates, looking at all those things. Student and community success, I think is a very important part of our existing mission statement. I agree this is really long and it would be very cumbersome to recite. Mm -hmm. uh, I would stop at community uh, as a short way to describe our mission, mm -hmm. and but for document purposes, we did include the whole thing. Yeah. So that's I, my feedback. So, but, and so I think the opportunity is, is, is for the board to lead us in reciting a vision statement in the going, mm -hmm. as, uh, if I understood correctly. And I think right. that, that'll be the, our, well, our visioning branding piece that we'll, we, we could launch to. Again, I think because the, the uh, prescriptive nature of, of, of meeting this, the needs for this uh, has largely to do with our accreditation piece. It now takes a different role. We're going to put it in a different category, right. use it for those purposes. Yes. We, 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 the board, with the board's input, we create a new vision statement. As I'm understanding, that's going to be the piece that we can that we would want to create one that we could use to start every meeting. Right. right? Yes. Okay, I'm just exactly. Just trying to repeat that. Just yes. Thank you. And and the feedback that you're giving us, those elements of the current mission statement that you want to make sure are captured, we can definitely incorporate yeah. those. those. But as right. Dr. Escamilla says, what this allows us to do is not just. Uh, tweak the wording, but to also make sure that we're using these to our best advantage. And it could be that our mission statement is best used as definitional. This is what we do. But for something that captures student success, it captures access, that's, that's our vision that we're building. The, the vision and the vision statement falls right in line with the, the, the obligations of the board. And yes. The purpose of the board mm -hmm. to, to be that visionary mm -hmm. uh, perspective uh, for the for the entire college district, and so right. there's a lot of. And whereas the mission blending. is definitional and may not change year to year, year over year, plan over plan, the vision that may change depending on your what we're seeing internally, externally. That's the piece that that's more uh, adaptive and and reflexive. Okay, so thank you for that feedback. Point taken. So this is the proposed mission. We other, but let's see if there's other regions who have comments first before sure. we move on. That, that supports supports banks is sound more secondary than, than being on the front line. That's just I, I reacted to the word supports. Okay. I, I like the first part, like uh, Miss Carol just said, because it's very similar to what we already have. But I'm wondering, is that those four bullets are they really necessary? Could we just shorten those by saying maybe? by offering programs that will allow our students to prosper or to meet their academic dreams? I don't know, do we need to have all those four bullets there? Well, in just a few minutes, we're gonna go back to your visionary words. We also have a proposed vision. What you're telling me, prosperity, success, what, where you want the college to be. To me, what you're describing is what you want within your vision. We may not that's up to the board, let's talk about this. We may not want to specify each of these, but we don't want them to get lost either. And, and I agree with you there, mm -hmm. and, and I know the committee has worked hard, mm -hmm. you know, putting this together, but mm -hmm. I just think, I don't know. It, it's, maybe it's just me that it's not really necessary to, okay. To list all of them. Well, right, mm -hmm. to get, exactly. It, we're satisfying the need for our accrediting body. That's, the, 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 what they want is, the reason why it's so, bulleted and kind of not as flashy as our other uh, mission statement is because they want an accrediting team to come in or they want uh, someone to come, a student to come to your uh, website. Um, they want to understand through your mission. They want you to use your mission to define who you are to your consumer, to your constituent, um, to those who are gonna come evaluate you uh, for reaffirmation. It, it's a tool. The mission statement is, is changed to a, it's become a tool. And that's, that's the evolution of the accrediting uh, agency. Things are just changing. The way they see things as a, as a commission um, is just causing us to, to do things a little differently. Um, 
And in this piece, it may be beneficial to be this specific because community colleges serve these particular populations where other, other institutions may not. Yes. So it's important to say community success, success and access, um, which tends to be a little bit more general. But we want to make sure in our mission statement we clearly define these are the populations that we serve and these are the services that we offer. Yes. Oh, no, yes. No, 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 well no. taken, well no. taken, and, and thank I you. I really like the first part of that because I think most of us have memorized our mission yes. statement yeah. already, so yes. that's why I like the first part, but again, you know, the, just offering my the, opinion. The, the, yeah, no, thank you so much, Regent Estrada. Um, again, the, the, the accrediting body changes. As a new commission is elected every so often, ever so often, they mm -hmm. come in with new ideas. They Remember, we just adopted our, our um, guidelines for reaffirmation in December. So they changed all the rules on us, all the mm -hmm. purposes. So they, they have a group of presidents that go in there and they switch everything up. And that's what you're dealing with right now. It's different than the last 10 year, uh, okay. the expectations yeah, of the last 10 year. And, and I understand process. that. I know it was a committee. However, it's just one person, you know, looking at things differently. But, but if this is what you want, I'll support it. It's more of what we need than what we want. Well, I'd love what to. You need. <laughs> this is what you need, okay? Yes, ma'am. Want yes, ma'am. Versus needs. I apologize. We're trying to make sure that the mission is comprehensive, as they, as our accreditor requires. Requires. Mm -hmm. Yep. And to tell you the truth, I know we're looking at this piece by piece, as we have to. The hope is each of these pieces will come together and form that basis. Yes, the mission statement looks long, and we bulleted it only so we could highlight the different pieces. The intention isn't to display it that way. In fact, you know, you have it written there in three lines, and the hope is that each of these pieces form that, that core basis of the plan. So I, I do really welcome that feedback. It's well taken. And let me show you the core values, and then we can talk about the vision. And I'm hoping that together we can, we can decide which piece we feel most comfortable with in which area. Well, right. Yes, we're repurposing that mission statement so that the mission is a clear definition, comprehensive definition, where the vision sets the tone, your tone for your meetings and for the, the activities now, of the college. Now, now that being said, um, as I recall the principles, a board must review its mission on a regular basis. Correct. Okay, so that doesn't preclude us from or call for us not reviewing the mission statement. Now, we don't have to recite it every time. There'll be a very stated uh, a purpose to sit down on one of the agendas throughout, throughout periodically to mm -hmm. review our mission. Um, currently, we use our opportunity at the beginning of every mission, excuse me, at the beginning of every uh, board meeting to recite it, and we, we pride ourselves on that. We're also going to have to go back at some point and review the mission overall. Yes, and make sure it meets our needs. I do have a comment. It says at the very end, for ec economic advancement, that's not the only advancement we're after, though. Economic and intellectual advancement. Economic and intellectual advancement. I like that. I had a question on that, too, because it wasn't clear if it was only in reference to the customized training or if it was in reference to all of those things. And the other thing, uh, and I completely get having to enumerate what the pieces of your mission are, but is that um, the other one also talked in terms of our, the quality of those programs, and mm -hmm. I think that is part of the mission, mm -hmm. and would like to see something with regard to quality included in it. Point taken. Yes. All right. So we have our mission statement, and usually your mission and your core values are presented together. The core values demonstrate what we stand for, the way in which we will pursue our mission and also our vision. These are the characteristics we believe are important in the way that we do our work. 
we have proposed core values that are a combination of what we have in our current strategic plan. Right now, we have core values and guiding principles. The core values were short bullet items, and then we had longer, um, more clearly defined guiding principles. We've combined them because there was some overlap. So we have a proposed list of core values, which you can see in full on the strategic plan proposal sheet. And they include, first and, foremo first and fo foremost, student learning and success, excellence in instruction, access, integrity, innovation, and diversity. I welcome your, your comments and your feedback. Do we believe these are the values that are important to us as we pursue this mission? I don't know if the silence is good or bad. I'm going to take we're, good. We're, we're reading. We're <laughs> um, I don't know if it maybe it belongs under integrity, where you talk about accountability, but there's there's not a place where we talk about fiscal accountability or the use of taxpayer funds or something along those lines. And so mm -hmm. there's I think there's a place potentially under integrity where we talk about uh, the financial integrity and and efficiency or effectiveness of the the resources that are provided to us through our students and taxpayers. So somehow incorporate, maybe separate, maybe, yeah. So we can definitely add that. Oh, that's, that's up to us. And it sounds like this is a very important piece of our core values. Yeah. It should stand alone. Yeah, our voters, taxpayers, our students, the resources that they provide to us. I mean, mm -hmm. I, I think it's an important piece that we address that. Excellent. We can add that. Thank you. You're welcome, and Ed. Are we leaving um, diversity open-ended on purpose, or do we want to say diversity of all kinds, that sort of thing, so that people understand that we're not only talking about ethnic diversity or racial diversity, that it's diversity of thought. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yes, that leaves it, that's not, que not clear the way it's written now. We can definitely articulate that out. Other comments, questions? Dr. Doming? Nope. No. You, you were pointing, I thought you. <laughs> well, no, I'll just say, you know, uh, like, like all mission statements, they're subject to change as, as the, the, the college proceeds and matures even more, uh, just like core values change. So, yeah, no, th th this is a great start. If there's something that happens, uh, comes to mind afterwards, you have this presentation in your board. Board book, board effects. I have two different, anyway, in your computer. Um, but uh, take a look at it. If something occurs to you over the weekend or next few days or in the next few weeks, just, just send it to us. We're, we're, we're glad to review that. And of course, we'll bring it back to the full board. Yes, this is our first draft. When we reconvene again in June, based on your feedback, your comments, we'll, we'll have another draft for you to take a look at. We just want to get your first impressions here based on the committee's proposal. Yeah. Core, yeah, at the core, it's, just, it's lesser than more, but if you have others, please put them on. We'll, we'll put everything on the table that you have so for, for review and consideration. Dr. Okay. Wilson, yes. what you just said about coming back in June, isn't that when you're going to show us a draft implementation plan in June as well? 
what you'll see, it won't be the full implementation plan. It'll be the articulated goals, objectives, KPIs, okay. and yes, this as well. And if there is, is it helpful for the board to review mission, core values, and vision before you get into some of that nitty gritty? Um, if, if you're going to take what we, what we talked about today, yes. would it be helpful to bring back uh, either at the April meeting or in May um, another review just so we have an opportunity to affirm that the revisions that you've made and what we're going to draft potentially today for a vision statement are in line? And that way you're not, we're all on the same page for, prior to you starting some of those goals and objectives. Would that be helpful? That May, May would be the, the ideal to give mm -hmm. us a little bit of time, to give everybody time to um, absorb and consider this, and then that way shortly after, we'll have a month from the May meeting to June, obviously, and that'll, I think that timing works best. Right. We'll be glad to. Okay. That's Don't a great recommendation. That, good, good, Very helpful. Good point to truly anchor, anchor all of our strategies with, with these in mind. Mm -hmm. Okay, great. And surely, I think Delmar appreciates their community a little bit more. I, I don't know. Um, I'm having to think about this, and I will send you my, my thoughts. Please do. That would be very helpful. All right. Oh, I'm skipping ahead. So let's go back to the words you selected. We want to take a few minutes. Um, the words for our vision. We want to talk about why you chose those words, why they were important. Lucy? Sure. So I'm actually going to move. That come on. Okay. I'm going to move over here and read these to you. These are the, the kind of your top choices. So connected, leader, financially sound, the graduate problem solved, inclusive, Responsible citizens, excellence in education, student completers, access and um, affordability, thank you, inspiring, accommodating, and affordable. So those are the words you came up with. Um, so if you would like to talk for a minute, and especially if I cut you off and maybe you'd like leave out a fourth word or something that you thought was really important, as you look at, as we've talked about mission and what we currently do in our definition of us and vision, are there any of these that maybe are already, we are doing, they are part of our mission as we're, we've talked about it, part of our core values and others that maybe are more important as we look forward in vision? Or as you look at them as a group, are there any that, that rise to the top and stand out for you? Share with us why you chose those words. I'll jump in there. Excellent. <laughs> uh, Libby and I had come up with, and we merged some of ours because mm -hmm. the connected was really about that to the community partners. Mm -hmm. Uh, that being in, in the other word that we had used was embedded with our community partners. Mm -hmm. um, so that was how we talked about that one. Which goes back to Regent Estrada's yeah. point about community. And mm -hmm. we did sort of the same thing with leader because it was like being a leader in academic success, being a leader in technology, mm -hmm. uh, applications of technology to help with the efficiency of the organization as well as with student success. and. Mm -hmm. the technology mediated education so it was trying to encapsulate um, a lot of thoughts into that one word <laughs> piggyback on your connected piece because uh, when she limited us to three cards that we could turn <laughs> in our fourth one was responsive to the community and so in and, and, and we I purposely left that broad because it's responsive to the business community, not just from a contract training standpoint, but who's ultimately going to hopefully hire our graduates, responsive to our other higher education partners, responsible to K to, responsive to K-12, responsive to the community in a very broad sense. 
Great. Well, these are very strong, visionary, aspirational words. Thank you for participating in this activity. We conducted a similar activity with our steering committee, and we have a proposal to share with you. Again, this is a rough draft. want you to take a look at it to see, are we on the same page? This is what our committee, um, using some of their words, they thought our vision could be. Del Mar College will be the first choice for life-changing educational opportunities provided by responsive, innovative faculty and staff who challenge students to improve communities locally and globally. Do you see your values? Do you see your words reflected there? Similarities? Are there concepts that are missing? Affordability is missing. Um, probably act, access. well, the word access, but I don't know if, if um, May I ask the thought behind first choice? Sure. And I say that um, because my personal belief is um, that I would want to encourage all education, frankly. Not that I'm not saying that we want students to come here, but does that put us in a competitive stance? The idea was that within the committee that we want to make sure that we offer, we offer programming for everybody and that we offer exceptional services and that we could, we offer services and education of the highest caliber in the region. But it's, it's a little bit tricky and again, it's aspirational that this is what we strive to be, but we wanna make sure that that wording truly reflects what our intention is. So it's, we wanted to show that we offer high-caliber high programs. I sort of go along with Libby in asking that because, you know, if you take it from a student perspective, their first choice needs to be what's right for them. And as much as I love Del Mar College, we are not the right first choice for every student. That makes sense. Again, this is the opportunity. This is the feedback. This is it. Yeah, Again, this, this is what we is want. Shell, this, this is, is a, what this we want. Is, this is a, an example to, 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 to get us all going. And oh, yes. If we needed to start over, we would. It doesn't sound, I mean, it sounds like we have some things, but we'll right. change. Is that where we could work in affordable? I mean, yeah. maybe not just affordable choice, because yeah. I don't want to just be the bargain, but maybe rather than first choice. High quality, the affordable. Available. Or access. Mm -hmm. access. Accessible. Mm -hmm. right. Affordable opportunity. Right. Mm -hmm. yeah. Affordability and access is, a, is a one of our core, underpin, uh, core underpinnings as an American community college. Yes. Absolutely. And we're taking note of all of these comments. Excellent. Well, this could also be the place there where you talk about excellence in education, where you talk about the quality piece, because what we offer needs to be of the highest value that we can offer. I mean, that we, and, and we certainly have the capability of doing that, um, but I, I agree with what you're saying about choice, that, that um, I'm not sure that that phrase is really what we're trying to capture here. I think it's about excellence in education, mm -hmm. and it's about, I, I really like the, the life-changing uh, educational piece. Um, I think that's really, that is key to, to what we're doing, because so many, so many of our students, again, don't come to us as 18-year-old freshmen ready to start a four-year university experience, they're coming here to, to make, make those steps, whether it's a two-year degree with us and going on or a two-year degree with us and finishing. I, ran, I, I met a woman the other day at, at, uh, in, in the hospital and that talked about getting her LVN at a community college, Wharton, not here, at, at Wharton Community College, and then she worked part-time and went on to get her, her uh, bachelor's, her BSN. And so here's a woman who started at a community college 
with her intention of moving on, and now she's a nurse at a major, uh, major hospital facility in the state. That's what we're talking about. We, we, we give students like her that first opportunity, and that, so that's why that life-changing piece is really strong for me. I Great. also like the improving communities locally and globally. I think we're more than just improving students. We're, we're about changing the world. So much of what we've talked about um, really is, Regent Scott, it's, it's, it's uh, similar to what you're saying. It, it's a beginning. You know, when we graduate, we have commencement, not conclusion or anything else. <laughs> we have commencement. It is a beginning of an evolution. Every one of the students will evolve to, to do other things, right? Um, and I think that evolutionary piece is, is uh, important. It's important and needs to be captured. Our committee really, really felt that life changing, that piece, that the fact that what we do changes not just an individual's lives, but a whole family's trajectory. We wanted to make sure that was captured in our vision. Quick, quick commercial. I, I think I picked up, I'm going to get the exact number, but I heard from one of our faculty members over in the biology department that our biotech program has produced eight or eight, nine or ten PhDs in the last 10 years nice. from major research institutions. That's yep. community college to PhD in its 10 years. Now, I'm, I'm going to get that confirmed, but I, I heard that from one of the faculty the other days, and yesterday was a great day, <laughs> great day for the whole natural sciences mm -hmm. department, but uh, mm -hmm. just, a, just a little commercial sure. to speak to the excellence. Yeah. I'm wondering is students, is the general word that we want to use there? Because students implies, I mean, when, what's the image when you say student? What's the image that comes to mind? So is it learner? Is it, um, I, I don't know what, but, but are who, people whose lives we are changing don't, are not the image of a typical student. So I don't know what that, what that word ought to be, but I'm just, I'm wondering if student is the right word. Perhaps it's just with some modifiers, mm -hmm. students of all ages or students, all types of students or, students, yeah. yeah. Which would speak all to the students. inclusiveness, yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, I know this is just the first time you're looking at these changes, again, when we, when we embarked on this, we thought, you know, these changes seem subtle, but I know that they're not. They form the basis of this plan. So I appreciate you taking a look at these first drafts, giving feedback on what, we, what we've what we worked on. I think the idea of coming back to this before the next um, retreat activity is a really good idea so that we can show you how we've incorporated this feedback. Everything that you're discussing today, we're taking note of, and we uh, wanna make sure to capture what you see as our vision, our definitional mission, and how we will achieve both. Okay. And again, as Dr. Scamilla said, after today, if you have any thoughts or ideas, please feel free to communicate them to, to myself, to Natalie, to Dr. Escamilla. All right, so we've had quite a productive morning. We looked at a lot of data, we talked about our next steps, and we saw the, the formulation of our plan, the beginning steps of our plan. We've come a long way since we started in September. And that wheel, we're gonna make progress along that wheel. So again, the goal is August. We're gonna have some steps until we get to August, but we want that finalized plan with your mission, core values, vision, goals and objectives. The implementation plan may come around that time, maybe a little later, the nitty gritty, but big picture, August is the goal. We've talked about these dates already, June 11th. I believe we're looking at a workshop before the board meeting, and then again, final approval in August. I hope that you see and you've, you've seen today that we are, we are taking what you're telling us, we're looking at our data, and we're really working to make sure that our plan will take us from where we currently are to where you envision us being. That's what we're doing collectively with you and also with our stakeholders. So I thank you for your time this morning. I hope it was productive for you because it really was for us. Dr. Escamilla, is there anything else you'd like to add? Regents, we, we leave this uh, last part of the meeting for any other feedback. And again, we always encourage you, I always encourage you to call me 
text me. It doesn't matter when. Just call me if you've got if you've got a burning issue about something that you want, particularly as it pertains to the information we presented. Call me. I'll call you back. <laughs> Unless I'm on the boat. Before we conclude, we do have a public comment posted as a part of this meeting. And I think we have one individual, Mr. Jack Gordy, who would like to make public comment. Uh, so if you'll give us a second, Mr. Gordy, you can come on up and just give us a second to transfer the... There we go. Thank you. It's on. Oh, okay. My name is Jack Gordy and I live at 40. It's on. 4118 Bray Drive. And what he just passed out to you is the information that I got from Del Mar. Okay? And it's about the lawsuit that was filed against the Attorney General. Now, from the information I got, Del Mar lost the lawsuit. They filed an appeal. They lost it. They filed a second appeal. They lost it. They filed a third appeal. They lost it. And now they filed the fourth appeal. The lawsuit was unjustified in the first place. There was no reason for it. No reason whatsoever for that lawsuit. And it's just showing a great disrespect for the Texas Attorney General to keep appealing his decisions. If I was the Texas Attorney General, I wouldn't trust Del Mar anymore because you keep appealing his decision. When his decision made sense, he said, release the information. It's nothing personal, nothing confidential. There's no reason to withhold it. And I know there was no reason to withhold it, but Del Mar keeps on. Just in two months, they spent $5,892, and the telephone calls again was... $2,889 for telephone calls to Austin. The total that's been spent on that lawsuit is $61,935. And the phone calls alone on the lawsuit to Austin, $24,933. Just to talk about that lawsuit. And like I said, there was no justification for the lawsuit in the first place. Uh, the... Uh, the lawsuit, like I said, was unjustified. There's only one reason for the lawsuit. Del Mar wants to keep secrets from the public and secrets from the Board of Regents. They don't want you to know what's going on. That's why the lawsuit was filed, and from what I've been told, the Board of Regents wasn't even aware the lawsuit was filed until it was brought to their attention by somebody else. Uh, I believe, and I'm requesting, that this Board of Regents go into closed session or discuss it publicly, why they filed the lawsuit in the first place, and why they keep appealing the Texas Attorney General's decision. Like I said, it's a waste of our money, the taxpayers' money. No reason to waste our money. Thank you, Mr. Gordy. Uh, with no other business to come before the Board, we are adjourned at 12.34 p.m. <laughs>